It was scary thinking that things were determined for me because I'm a floating energy ball in the universe and I don't matter. And then I realized, oh, I'm a floating ball of energy in the universe. <laughs> I can be good to people. I can be kind and considerate and compassionate. Oh, we don't have to hurt each other. We don't have to be rude to each other. We don't have to do things. Oh, how do I do that? Because I was never able to do that as a society and I couldn't do it as an individual. I needed to be a specific consciousness. I needed to be a specific bubble building Britney consciousness. I needed to say to myself, oh, I'm allowed to say, I don't want to hurt either of you. And I'm allowed to handle the consequences of people being upset at me for not wanting to take sides of whose baby should die. Because that is what society has told them. The individuals in the society has told them, choose, choose whose babies we should kill. And I'm saying, what if we killed no one's babies? And they're saying, no, that's not an option. We have to kill someone's babies. And I'm saying, yeah, but what if we don't kill anyone's babies? They're like, no, that's not an option. We have to choose someone's babies have to die. Because their ability to evoke free will is so limited that they're, they are determined to re like repeat the cycles of moving energy that clashes against itself. We are moving energy that is clashing against itself. And I do think evoking free will allows you to move it in a different direction, but you living in the present and meditating of living in the present, like literally the present moment of your energy moving is why people dedicate their life to meditation. But it is very difficult. And it also doesn't sell tickets and it doesn't sell YouTube videos. And it means like, what is money? And like, it would shift all of society. And this construct that society and individuals live in within the society in order to become specific consciousness, like a conscious, specific consciousness, and to recognize the macro, we would have to reorganize everything, everything we do. So when I say, oh, a five is having a two moment, I'm trying to say, oh, look, the person who knows that there's a macro is also going back down into the society and individual level and forgetting to be a specific consciousness because being a specific consciousness is a practice form of living in the present. It's a radical acceptance form of meditation. Oh, okay. So basically today I wanna to talk about free will. Like I said, I think it will upset some people and if you guys feel a need to be upset in the comments, I welcome your anger. You know, sometimes anger is justified and sometimes it's just justified because it's a feeling more than it's a concrete idea. And I know the subject of free will is very important to a lot of communities and bubbles and so I just wanna like welcome you to this space to express yourself in that way. I'm a little hesitant to talk about free will sometimes because as you guys know, uh, people take it personal. There is a lot of personal that ha that coincides with the conversation around free will, right? If we don't have free will, what does that mean when someone hurts my family? If we don't have free will, what does that mean when... E okay. So we're going to tackle it from a philosophy perspective. I'm going to talk about my level system. If you don't know what my level system is, that's okay. There's a link in the description. Uh, should be a link in the description. If you guys want to watch the video when the stream is done... It, you know, I'm going to try to go over the, it a little bit, but, you know, I want to welcome discourse and I know people might feel angry. If I feel like you're getting too triggered, I might mute you for a while, but I'll give you guys some moments to express yourself. <laughs> okay. There's so many questions you could ask about the subject of free will, so feel free to ask them. Um... And yeah, I just wanted to give that a little bit of a caveat before we start. We're still warming up the convo, guys. If you guys want to talk about a few things beforehand, we can. I just want to give that a little bit of a caveat. You know what I mean? We're going to talk about something pretty heavy. Bring a blanket. Bring some warm tea. You know, get ready to like challenge your biases. I know people want to pretend that they're introspective and people want to tell themselves, I've thought about these things. But if you watch enough YouTube like I do or enough radio shows or if you've been to therapy or if you've heard therapists talk, Many people never ask themselves questions they don't even know to ask themselves, right? So especially in relation to free will, okay? There's a lot of that. So please, 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 like give yourself, uh, be kind to yourself, you know, as we have this conversation. How does the concept of free will make people upset? Well, 
if you start asking yourself about free will, you really do have to start asking yourself about war, rape, destruction, starvation, how we run society, obligation to society, right? A lot of religious people base their uh, choice to be good off of this concept around like free will and choosing God. A lot of secularists, you know, have sort of mixed feelings on that. You know, are we talking about free will as a species or free will within the rules of humans have created? Uh, we're talking about free will in terms of us as a species. So biologically, us as a consciousness. So our ability to have a relationship with our consciousness. And then on the macro, macro, like quantum physics. Now, I am not as educated at all in quantum physics. So we're going to refer to other people about this. But mostly it's that concept, right? Um, that just from a very base level of how we've even come to be. And like we're just like kind of like moving through the universe, clashing into one another with no real say and how that works on the very macro. And I think there's something to that right? I was born a Britney. You know, a lot of what I do in life, you could argue is determined just because of my personality type, right? And at the same time, like I heavily believe in my ability to evoke choice and free will. And I think I have a lived experience that shows me the differences between I when I think I'm evoking it and when I think I'm not so much. So I actually think it's probably a little bit of both. Uh, I just think we have more power than we believe we do. But I don't think people have the spoons or desire to actually evoke free will i don't think people want to ch that's why some people think like people don't change which could be a very elementary view of determinism i'm a i am a student okay and when i say i feel like i've discovered something in relation to introspection and free will i'm saying i've discovered something that's like a very lived experience and I'm not saying I'm answering any great scientific questions out there. I'm not that smart, but I am smart enough to know that I've discovered something worth paying attention to because it's, I think it's, it could really change people's lives if they need it to change their lives, right? So when I think of free will, I'm going to categorize, because you know, I love categorization girls. I'm going to categorize it in three specific ways. I'm going to say the free will on the macro. So that's the sciencey stuff. That's quantum physics. That's atoms and molecules and things bashing up against each other and the universe moving us in a particular way. And the universe just meaning the expansion of space and everything we understand about that, which is basically nothing. Okay. So, so macro is like the universe. Okay. I'm, I'm writing down my own notes because I need a visual to refer back to. So micro is like the universe. And, or, I'm sorry, macro is the universe. So we're talking about the things that biologists are studying and the things we're going to refer to a biologist in just a moment here. We're going to talk, you know, and refer to people who are studying things that are sort of on a, a very unknown level to the average person, myself included, right? Okay. Then we're going to come down to sort of the free will of the bubble. So that's society as a whole, not the individual yet. I think free will is a relationship that you can have as a group of human. So like a species of human. You can look at that as like society, meaning the species. So does human beings as a collective, do we, do we have a relationship with free will? And I would say as a collective, we have always a less of a relationship with free will, which is why when I look at the macro and I look at the universe, of course we don't have free will on the macro. Because as a whole conglomerate of all the energy in the universe, there's nothing. We don't exist. This is my argument for the levels. My levels is a anecdotal, yes, relationship I had in my own life between existing and existence. And I had to have to, I had to ha come to this conclusion that like Brittany doesn't exist because on the macro of the human universe, not only do I not exist as a consciousness from that lens because I'm not identifiable, but I mean, quite literally when I die and my energy gets recycled back into the universe, I'm just like this bouncing thing in the universe that I don't even have free will over. So in some ways it's determined because there's like this movement from the universe that's pushing us in a direction whether we identify this thing as us, right? So on the macro, like I don't even exist. What is a you, right? But if you come down and you zoom in a little bit and you come down to the bubble and you look at society, you still don't really exist, right? So if I looked at myself as a gay, a woman, an Assyrian, if I looked at myself as a category, 
I still don't exist. I am one of millions that fit into a bubble that shift and move with culture and expectation. So I still don't even exist yet. Now, if you come down even further to, let's say there's three levels, the individual's next. And again, I'm simplifying this, right? Individual, meaning the thing we call me and the thing we call you. Well, now there's a consciousness that's an individual consciousness. We can, you know, validate and verify as thing called Brittany. Cool. Okay. Now I exist. But I didn't exist when I was in a bubble as a societal bubble. I only existed in the individual bubble and the people who knew me within the bubble by name and consciousness right? When you're driving on the freeway, those people you're seeing, they don't exist to you. Because if they existed to you, I think you would treat them slightly better. In a sense, we also can't move through life like everyone truly exists, because I think it's too overwhelming to just throw at people, which is why when you go through the journey of the levels, it feels like too much information. It's why you often can feel lost in it, because you have to acknowledge that every single person is you. This thing we call you and me. Every single person you meet, every person you hate, every person who's done awful things in the world, every person who's awful in your belief system, that's you. And they're no different than you. If you go down even more, ooh, okay, I'm going to say that's the individual consciousness. Okay, fourth category, actually. So we're going to go macro bubble, societal bubble, individual me and you bubble and then we're going to go specific consciousness specific consciousness level and that's the you you not even the general you okay so everyone in the world exists the way you exist but then if you go even deeper there's like this thing this body this particular flesh bag that's holding the consciousness that is what we call Brittany this name that was given to me by somebody else, right? Which is great. Love that. Thanks. And at the same time, like I didn't choose to be here in the way that nobody else had before us. And so in so many ways, when you go back to the macro, it goes back to the idea of determinism versus free will, right? We can't even choose to be here. And we're ostracized from society when we choose not to be here. So we are told literally, okay, I actually, can I Can I pull this up on screen for you? How do people, how do other YouTubers do this where they have like a paint pro? So on the macro part of society, so that's like that top part of society, okay? We are very much acknowledging, I know this might be hard for people because again, I can't speak outside of your bubbles of religion, which is like a very much a societal bubble thing, right? So when you go to the macro of free will, you're talking about something so outside of our comprehension that of course it's just recycled energy knocking up against each other. There is no you and me, we don't exist there. And then if you go down to society, that's where religion lives and culture lives and construct lives. That's where human beings went and said, oh, let's make this thing as a collective. And as a collective, we have this belief around what is free will and what isn't free will. So they make up sort of like using their free will Though some would say they never had it in the first place because they lack the introspective to utilize it in an efficient manner. And that's why they have to make a construct because they don't have the free will enough to, they have just enough free will to create a construct, but not enough free will to destroy the construct they had to create to feel comfortable in a world without construct. (laughs) Oh my God, does that make sense? So I'm going to re-explain that because I feel like sometimes when I talk, it makes sense to my brain, but I don't know if that's going to make sense to you, okay? So... On the macro, we are just energy in the universe knocking up against each other, right? Then we have society, which has like this evolved species. Macro existence uh, without influence. That's a good way to say it. Exists without influence. Existence without influence. That's good, right? Then we come down to society and it's a collective hive mind, which is normal and reasonable and we evolved to be this way and I think it's good, okay? And then we have this desire as an evolving species to say hey why did we why did we come to be here and because we're lacking introspection we created a construct utilizing this thing on free will on a macro scale like my micro tool scale called a construct of like religion or belief 
and then utilizing free will, though limited, we needed the construct to, do you know what I mean? Okay, it makes sense to you guys. Okay, good. So I, the irony is that we're smart enough and have enough free will on a societal level to create a construct, but not enough on the introspective level to destroy the construct and live without it and to be comfortable with the macro reality that you and I don't exist, right? And then if you go down to the individual level, which is still perceived by others in society, you know, I, Brittany, is the individual, okay? And then if you go down, like, that person exists here. I am Brittany the YouTuber, right? I am Brittany the YouTuber, and you guys know me as the queer girl, the Assyrian, the other thing. You can individually identify Brittany through the societal expectation of identity, right? Evoked by the free will enough to make a uh, construct, but not enough to break it. So then you have to get down to the specific consciousness level, right? Where you're able to view me as a specific consciousness outside of the societal identifiers of individual. Can you view Brittany outside of the construct? I got a message yesterday on my live chat that made me really, really feel for this person who was disappointed in me because they didn't like my opinion about something that was very personal to them. And I stayed up all night looking up stuff about free will and trying to say, how am I going to explain this to people, right? How am I going to explain to you that the thing you're going through that's so painful for you is about you, but isn't even about you. You did not even choose to have this relationship with the subject matter because you're not even aware that you can allow me to choose not to engage with it in the same way. When we don't allow other people to choose their engagement in a really profound way, we're denying ourselves the choice to engage with it too. When you actually cannot in the two way live and let live, you're not allowing yourself to live and let live because you're trapped by the construct of what you perceive to be free will. And it's actually not. It's been determined for you by your bubble. Your bubble in a cultural way has determined and that bubble was determined by the macro way of things just hitting up against each other and floating around, right? And so when I got that message yesterday, it did it did make me say like, what am I supposed to do to convey to this individual consciousness, my individual consciousness? Well, I can't because they only view me through the lens of their societal consciousness bubble. They literally can't see me enough to let me live and let live because they need me to feel their suffering, but they have to remember I'm not them. And they're not even them. They don't even exist. But they exist in a, in a very individual micro sense, and then through the societal bubble, and then in the individual, and then as an energy floating through the universe. So we exist, and we don't exist at the same time. It's sort of this like paradox of tiny contradictions of existence and living. We exist, we are existing. And at the same time, like, what does it even mean to exist, right? When you need people to feel the way you feel about something, right? So, okay, let's go back to my little, <laughs> look at me. I'm so tech savvy. <laughs> Boomer Brittany coming through. Okay, macro, societal, individual, and specific consciousness. We're having a relationship. And that's why people will say, like, what's the point of existing without relationships? You're right. But the relationship you're having doesn't even have to be to other people. It could be to anything that's alive, which is most things, right? So if you look at the universe and see it as this living entity, you can be satisfied with the relationship you have with it and you don't necessarily need people. It's just people are one of the greatest things the universe has like produced. And so we're this great thing to interact with. But you also can't have that relationship with the universe until you learn to have the relationship outside of it as well. You're getting at the core of human beings, finite transcendence, I think. Maybe. This is the type of stuff I love to contemplate on. Good, good. Okay, good, good. Okay, so free will can be collaborative, some a collaboration sometimes. Yes. Okay, I'm also not ignoring your messages. I should probably go back and try to hit them up. Uh, well, I think individuals can make decisions on the micro level. There is no free will. So when we build, nothing can be free will. But I can see how that's silly for individual uh, individuals making choices. I'd... I'd probably say individuals have free will at the very least if they evoke it to an extent that consciousness can have free will to the degree we understand the concept of what is free will, right? 
I just had a ha-ha moment of understanding Brittany's point of view. You believe meaning can only be made in the lower scales of understanding, not that it necessarily is found in the higher scale. Right, right. There is no meaning here. But people make meaning in the macro because God created us. They make themselves bigger than we know that we are. Instead of radically accepting that we're probably just little energy balls fall, like floating through the universe and that should be profound enough. It should be profound enough that this is my life and that this is my existing and that I, I am alive in the world. It should be profound enough that I am, I am what I am, what I call here. But it's not. So on the macro, we can't, we can't because there's no meaning there. We create meaning when we become a society. So we evolved and we created this thing called society. And then within that society, we have different bubble and cultural fractions that decided this belief is the true one. And this is why we're here. And this is what this war is about. And this is why we hate these people. And this is why we believe this. And that society pulls off into little boop, 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 little dots around the world and then little individuals inside of that. So then we have the angsty individuals that are like, I'm better than everybody involved. I'm self-aware. I actually know what's happening in Gaza. I actually know what's actually happening in politics. I actually know. What if I told you you still didn't know? And then it gets down to the specific consciousness. What if you go through layers and layers of introspective journeying, this whole path into introspection, an understanding of yourself only to realize on the macro, you were meaningless. And back down, you're meaningless once again. Every time you allow your ego to convince you you matter, you shoot right back up to the societal and individual. The macro, you never existed. Your meaning is your energy purpose, which is just, just to be. Notice how energy isn't naturally threatening, but can be depending on how you describe threatening. You can just be on the macro. And then you form a society and now you can't just be. Now you have to be exactly what they want you to be. And they is everyone around you and yourself. You guilt yourself into believing the bubble. And then you go down to the individual that claims it's rebellious and, oh, I'm a rebel and I know more than society. And then you turn into your own little bubble of society and then you form a group and you call yourself atheists that are against religious people. And then you call yourself this group who's against this group and this group is against this group and you become another society against another society. And then you come down to the specific consciousness, which is like you, but the you that exists outside of the other yous, which is why when I work one-on-one -on -one with people, I am asking them, who are you outside of the bubbles? Who are you outside of everybody else? Who are you if I took your consciousness and I had to have a relationship with the macro? You are just energy floating through the universe. Okay, does that kind of make sense? So when I think about the levels, okay, let's go back to this. Um, how do I explain the levels in relation to this? So if I think about the levels, okay, How do I explain this? When I think of, oop, it, oh, I did it again. Wait, okay, hold on. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, I simplify everything, because again, I'm a simple person. So on the, uh, actually I should have done it. Sorry, I should actually, oh, <gasps> what did I just do? Okay, hold on, maybe I should. Okay, the macro is understood by four and five, society is understood in a like a very like specific way. Uh, I would say like a, a real understanding way. Society can be understood by one, two, three, four, and five. Well, actually maybe ones can't understand society. I'm gonna take that back maybe. An individual, hmm. Actually, ones can choose. No, I think ones probably can't. See, this is why the levels is a work in progress. I would say ones understand the individual against the world. Two, three, four, and five. And then specific consciousness can be understood by twos, threes, fours, and fives. I don't think ones have a relationship with their specific consciousness, which is why they're failing. But they have enough to understand 
individual in terms of society because usually society points them out and they know that. Like they know Jerry from Rick and Morty knows he's a person, but he can't have a relationship with a specific consciousness and he can't have a relationship with the macro. But he barely even understands society. He doesn't even have a relationship with it, right? I know a lot of people are like, um, Jerry's the five and Rick is the Rick is the one. Just because Rick's an asshole doesn't mean he's a one. That's not what that's not what one means, right? We're talking about the relationship you're having with the introspection of this this relating to free will, right? So the reason I think when people become more introspective, they become less violent, and it's because you when you realize you're floating energy through the universe, I think it becomes really silly to hurt people. That doesn't mean fives won't cheat. It doesn't mean fives won't hurt people. It doesn't mean fives won't choose to make decisions within their own biases. It doesn't mean they're not biological creatures. It doesn't mean that they don't have mental illness. It doesn't mean they can't get into a coma. It doesn't mean anything. Being a five doesn't make you magic. It makes you more human. It makes you more radically, it, it makes you radically accept the universe. Now, again, I'm still a student in all of this. And the way that I have experienced it in a very anecdotal way is a relationship with testing things out. I've noticed that with myself, and I'm happy to throw myself under the bus, I haven't always evoked my free will. You've seen me break down on the internet. You have seen me be unsure of a social situation. You've seen me look at people and get upset. You've seen me in a moment not sit there and ponder, but to feel the moment of the the societal bubble pressure to like get into the heat of it. That's why debate panels and everything make people kind of uglier because it sets off. And it's why I try really hard when I'm doing it not to do it. And when I don't do it, people point it out and they're like, oh, Brittany's being different than us. But what I'm trying to do is force us to not do that thing that sounds introspective, but is actually blocking our introspection because it feels naturally good to us. It biologically feels natural to us to form a society, to form they them versus us, to literally hate other people, right? It feels natural to us because it's the way we survive. We herd together. So I'm not even upset that you do it. I'm just saying, okay, there's another path which you only can choose if you need to choose it. Now, here's the irony. I believe in free will, but I also think I was destined to be this person. I could not not be more introspective. I could not find this stuff interesting. Let me rephrase. I find this stuff so interesting that I couldn't deny engaging with it. And it would have been better to die than not engage with it in a way. Because when I was on, when I was in my unaliving stages, when I was facing myself, when I was questioning everything about my existing and existence, I faced death many times, and I was like, I just want to die, because I was stuck between this, this little, I was stuck between having moments of like, I'm in society, I'm in society, but I'm an individual, but I'm an individual, I'm in society, I'm in society, I'm an individual, I'm an individual, but I really just want to be a specific consciousness. I want to be a specific consciousness. I want to be a specific consciousness. But what does it mean to do that? Oh my God, the macro. When I had the macro moment, the real deep, profound, I believe, understanding that I was floating energy in a universe, I was like, and then it was like, everything was horrible again because it was all determined for me. And then everything was great again because I could evoke free will and go down to being a specific consciousness. It was scary thinking that things were determined for me because I'm a floating energy ball in the universe and I don't matter. And then I realized, oh, I'm a floating ball of energy in the universe. <laughs> I can be good to people. I can be kind and considerate and compassionate. Oh, we don't have to hurt each other. We don't have to be rude to each other. We don't have to do things. Oh, how do I do that? Because I was never able to do that as a society and I couldn't do it as an individual. I needed to be a specific consciousness. I needed to be a specific bubble building Britney consciousness. I needed to say to myself, oh, I'm allowed to say, I don't want to hurt either of you. And I'm allowed to handle the consequences of people being upset at me for not wanting to take sides of whose baby should die. Because that is what society has told them. 
the individuals in the society has told them, choose, choose whose babies we should kill. And I'm saying, what if we killed no one's babies? And they're saying, no, that's not an option. We have to kill someone's babies. And I'm saying, yeah, but what if we don't kill anyone's babies? They're like, no, that's not an option. We have to choose someone's babies have to die. Because their ability to evoke free will is so limited that they're, they are determined to re like repeat the cycles of moving energy that clashes against itself. We are moving energy that is clashing against itself. And I do think evoking free will allows you to move it in a different direction, but you living in the present and meditating of living in the present, like literally the present moment of your energy moving is why people dedicate their life to meditation. But it is very difficult. And it also doesn't sell tickets and it doesn't sell YouTube videos. And it means like, what is money? And like, it would shift all of society. And this construct, the society and individuals live in within the society in order to become specific consciousness, like a conscious, specific consciousness, and to recognize the macro, we would have to reorganize everything, everything we do. So when I say, oh, a five is having a two moment, I'm trying to say, oh, look, the person who knows that there's a macro is also going back down into the society and individual level and forgetting to be a specific consciousness because being a specific consciousness is a practice form of living in the present. It's a radical acceptance form of meditation. It's saying, okay, even when I'm facing this thing, when I have a falling out with a YouTuber and we're disagreeing, we are balls of energy in conflict. And when I am not evoking my free will, I don't understand them. I don't have any grace with them. I am judging them. But when I'm a specific consciousness, it is what it is. You know, according to my values, which are a construct created by me, I can be upset. But outside of that construct, when I go back into the macro, what am I upset about? Nothing. Now, society can't run the way that it's built on nothing matters. And at the same time, if people radically accepted that nothing matters and there is a macro, I don't think we would have to worry about people hurting us. Except for the humans that are, forgive me for saying it this way, still on a journey of introspection who don't know it. The only people who I think are actually a threat to society and the reason I think a majority of people are twos are the people who haven't radically accepted that they're balls of energy in the universe. And so they live in their constructs of violence and they choose violence and they choose all the things that come with violence because that's what their biology is telling them to do, which is reasonable, right? Because how could they do anything different? They are so afraid I can't put down my gun first because they'll kill me, probably. It's like the Great Battle of Alabaster. It's like any, it's like Luffy. Right? It's like, do you really know what's happening behind closed doors and how many people are pulling strings and how many people are in conflict? Do you think you know the truth of every situation when you don't even know the truth of the, your own family members? We see what we want to see. We understand what we want to understand. I think the more introspective people are, the less violent society we would be. But even if the world was all fives, people who radically accepted there's a macro... And like we're floating balls of energy in the universe, they would have babies. And those babies would have to then, okay, be biological little creatures that were born into a society and became individuals and had to go through the whole journey themselves. Introspection is not, introspection, extrospection in conjunction with one another. If you go deep enough or wherever you want to, however you want to phrase it, right? You really can radically accept that like everything that happens is a choice we are making. When I'm in conflict with someone, I'm that energy smashing up against them. And my, like I have to evoke free will to say, can I do something else with this? And it might take me a second to figure it out because I'm not perfect and I'm still a student. But that's my goal is when moments like that happen in real time, being able to like evoke free will at every moment and not just when I when I think about it in hindsight, right? I'm better at it than I've ever been though. And that's my proof that I think I can keep going. 
I have evidence in my own life, and I think DBT really helped me figure it out. Like when you overcome mental illness and you realize like, yeah, you can actually learn to like have a different relationship with your brain. You can then attach that to other methods or other, other not methods, other moments of uh, lacking free will in your life. And so you're like, okay, cool. I have evidence I can do this. I have evidence I can do this, not perfectly, not every time, not every moment, but if I can do it once, I can do it again. And if I can do it again, I can do it again. And if I can do it again, I can do it again, I can do it again, I can do it again. Until I hit my goal, which I probably won't hit, but man, am I gonna work on it for the rest of my life, right? And so again, when I'm thinking about free will, I'm thinking about the relationship we're having with the macro, which is determined balls of energy floating through space, knocking up against each other, floating in the universe. We are just floating in the universe right now, knocking into each other, having a relationship with one another. And then I have to examine and accept that we will form societies that are all made up. And then we will call ourselves individuals within that society. And then some of us will break out of all those societies and those individual labels and become a specific consciousness. And then when we're trying to relate to other people, we'll jump back into using those words and we'll use the things called I'm a Syrian and I'm this and I'm this and I'm this, which is like true in terms of categorization. So even though it's not true on the macro because we're all the same, it is true on the micro in the same way that if you examine, what's a good example, guys, I'm sure you can come up with 20 of them. If you look at something and on the big, on the Big picture, it just looks like a flower, but if you zoom in, a flower just isn't a flower. A flower is petals and stems and seeds and everything else that goes into what a flower is. That's humans. On the macro, we don't even exist. And when you zoom in, like Horton here to who, right? He has like this dandelion and there's a whole community of people all living on this little dandelion, but only Horton here to who can hear it because he's a Horton. He's got a bit, he's an elephant, right? That's life, but we can't do it. We can't actually do it as a society. And so what I think philosophers and, and mystics and gurus and all these people that are authentically on this journey are trying to figure out is, can we do it as a species without stopping people from having babies, without murdering people on the mass and without brainwashing and without control? Can people of their own free will choose to stop being violent choose to stop being awful to people. And then you have to take into consideration our biology, which goes back to determinism. Some people, some humans, because we're biological creatures, are born what people might call defective, right? I don't know what that means exactly because everyone has a different idea of what that means in their mind right now. But I'm thinking of the brains that might be incapable of empathy to such a degree that they actually can't even introspect enough to have a relationship that isn't going to just continually harm people in a specific way. Much like a animal. I think my cat has a very specific consciousness. I think it's clear. And then there was another cat we had in our family that was very adorable and it's very loved, but there's not much of a consciousness there. It's just like a cat. Sometimes I meet an animal and I'm like, that's a little animal with a consciousness. I can see it engaging. And then sometimes I meet humans and I'm like, are you engaging? We watched, I shared the story on my Discord, horrible story. One of the only things I've given a trigger warning for. And it was a guy in a nine, uh, not, in a, not a nine, blah, 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 in an interrogation room. And he was just talking about how he raped his mom's dead corpse and he had sex with the cat and it just got worse and worse and worse as he kept going. And I was like, oh my God. And it just, he said it so nonchalantly. And it wasn't like he was just born into a bubble. Cause like, there's no culture that's quite exists. He didn't have a community that taught him to be this way from my understanding, but he as an individual within society had a brain that just went, this is reasonable, which is interesting. Right? Because how did he end up that way? Was he just lacking introspection? Or was he actually physically damaged in a very biological way that he wouldn't have had a choice? Which in that way, you could say he's energy in the universe that's in conflict with other energies. And that's why there's always conflict. Because again, if we're not, you know, picking and choosing genetics, if we're not trying to get perfect humans out of every baby, then we're allowing for possibly people with brain damage to come into the world, maybe psychopath, maybe psychopaths, maybe sociopaths, I don't know, right? 
to come into the world and interact with everybody and maybe they won't have the relationship, right? When I describe ones, I'm not describing these people for the record. When I'm describing ones, ones cannot have these problems. Ones have to be people with the right tools and the the making the decision to basically not engage, which you could argue is like a lack of free will to such a degree that they can't even engage. This is very important in relation to my work. Ones are not psychopaths. They're not narcissists. They're not people with mental health problems. They're not people who are disabled. They're not people. That's not what that is. Ones aren't people in comas. Ones are people who deny free will engagement to such a degree that they can't even form a society or a god. They live in a reality where like they are the society, but they're not the individual because they actually usually rely on other people to some extent. So they have some understanding, right, of the individual, which is why I didn't put them in the category of society. For some reason, ones struggle in the society model. They know the individual model, but they can't get down to the con the specific consciousness and they certainly can't get to the macro. Ones are very weird. It's why I think they're very interesting because I know ones can get better, but how does a one go from understanding that they exist as an individual, but they can't function within society and they can't be, um, cause they can't engage in the, like two Bs, religious people that form a construct that evoke free will, that believe in free will usually, let's say you're a Catholic who believes in free will, you have a relationship with sort of, sort of responsibility or obligation to do better and you often will choose to engage in that because of a belief. Ones cannot do this. Ones cannot engage with free will enough to even adhere to a belief, like a real belief, like a, like a belief that makes them do something, right? Beliefs make us do something usually. And then knowing certainly, well, should encourage us to do things, but does it, right? When people believe things, it usually means they're going to follow up with an action. And ones can't seem to do that for some reason, right? But twos, threes, fours, fives, absolutely. Twos especially, who I think is the majority of the world, they evoke free will just enough to have a belief that they formed a society. And that's why when every time I'm in a debate panel and people are like, you're not going to make a prescription for society? Yeah, no, that's kind of like everyone else is already doing that. I'm trying to be the one who's saying you can do something else. And everyone's like, no, not that. And I'm like, okay. Because when you form a society, which is fine, you are going to kick people out, which is also fine. Whose babies are we going to kill today? That is always the philosophy question you have to ask yourself. When you form a society, which is fine, it's what you're biologically driven to do, whose babies aren't coming along? Because that's what you're doing. And I'm not judging you for it. How can I judge you from doing from doing something that is so reasonable? It is so reasonable to form a society. It is so reasonable to have morals. It is so reasonable to form personal ethics. It is so reasonable to have a relationship with these things, right? It is so reasonable. Sorry, reverse that. It's so reasonable to have ethics societally and morals individually. But you know what I mean? It is so normal. So I really am not judging people for being twos or even ones. I used to judge them for being ones because I was a baby five and I didn't know. But like, okay, I'm working on it. I'm still a student. I'm working on it. Everyone is everyone is everyone. And the question is, what are you going to do when that energy collides? Okay, let's go to comments. Discord says, would you say on the specific that free will, one's consciousness is had, but not always engaged with and thus evoking it while one lives and is sometimes not possible or vice versa? I would say, and if this answers your question or doesn't, let me know. I would say when you're the specific consciousness, okay, you're living as a specific consciousness, you have moments where you become a biological, like you become more biological than consciousness, if that makes sense. Because I think your brain is one thing, your body is one thing, and your consciousness is one thing. So this is my belief. I believe there's three parts to a person, right? Your brain, okay, your body, 
and your consciousness. And I think your consciousness has higher understanding of the universe than your brain. Your brain is like this motor that runs the body and helps you figure out like your mental health and where you're at and it conveys messages to you, but it's a computer. And then within that computer lies like this like secret consciousness that actually controls the computer itself, which is the brain. That's sort of how I look at it. So when you're a specific consciousness and you become more of your biology or your brain overpowers and sends a lot of messages out, it's like your body reacts a certain way because it's like, oh, the computer is saying to act this way. But then the consciousness is like, ah, do I want to stop that program from going or should I let it run? And sometimes we let the program run, which is why we're not always our best selves, which is why I'm not perfect, which is why you're not going to be perfect. No one's going to be perfect, right? We're all going to live in a harsh reality that we have to accept that we are not perfect. And that is very difficult. And so when I ask people, why do you think you do that? And they give a very like debate bro response. I'm seeing what they're doing, right? They're an individual who's taking on the societal model and reacting and giving an answer that society would accept. But they're not engaging with their specific consciousness and they're certainly not thinking on the macro. When you logic your way, when you cope and logic your way out of into or out of an answer, you're an individual who's thought about it enough to appeal to society. You are not giving a real answer about your consciousness or the root of your consciousness. You're not actually evoking free will to the extent you could be if you were more introspective, but you are evoking a level of free will enough to make this explanation as an individual in relation to society. So that's why people always feel like, I know what I'm doing. I'm smart. I'm capable. But then they don't know how they find themselves in situations where like, how did I do this again? How is this my life? Because in that moment, you are an individual enough to know, but you appealed so hard to society, you lost yourself in it again, and you keep forgetting that there's actually another layer to knowing yourself, and that's the specific consciousness, right? So how do you get to know yourself as a specific consciousness? You test it. You put it in situations you make it do things. You have relationships and conversations with yourself and the universe and animals and plants and trees and people and everything. And you gather data like I'm doing now with you. I am gathering data. And I'm trying to figure out which part of it is correct and which part of it is wrong. Right? Discord says, oh, okay. I'm going to make sure you can hear me because every time I twist my head. I would agree with it. So specific uh, is an individual consciousness, one layer of existence or existing, right? So sometimes we engage with it, but when you have to engage with others, we can disconnect and end up being more wrapped up on the other layers, like fives who are two moments. Yes, exactly. Exactly. When you're existing, so when I'm like existing and I'm a Brittany and I'm like in my full free will and I'm engaging, well, full free will, you know what I mean? There's like moments like, um... You guys ever have a conversation with someone and you can tell they're being defensive so you get defensive and then you have to ask yourself internally like, okay, am I actually getting, why are they defensive? Wait, why am I defensive? That's a moment where if you can ask yourself in that moment, so no, okay, what happens normally is somebody will pick a fight with you. Let's say you're chilling at home and everything's good and your sibling comes up to you and they hit you over the head and they're like, oh, sorry. You're like, I was just eating my cereal and minding my business. Why did you hit me on the head? And then, oh, sorry. You're not sorry. Why would you do that? That reaction is valid. What the fuck is your sibling doing? But in that moment, your sibling is lashing out, not evoking their free will, though evoking their free will. They're having an individual experience in a society moment, the interaction they're having with you. And they lashed out using what they think is free will, but it's only partial because they're also in the mode of, I'm allowed to do this because I've created a construct that allows me to do this. And they hit you upside the head because they're upset, but they don't know how to explain it to you. And you in that moment can decide to be initially triggered biologically upset, mentally upset. Oh my God, why is my sibling doing this? I'm going to... Mm. Or you could be like, so right now I want to fight you and maybe stab you five times. But I'm going to ask you very calmly, like, do you understand that what you just did was super inappropriate? And what you're doing is you're fighting your body's desire to go back to the society brain and individual brain that says defend yourself. And what you're doing is saying like, why am I getting defensive when I should be 
sort of aware that I might need to be defensive, right? Even though I've been struck, I might not get struck again. It might just be energy bashing up against me. Energy, you know, in conflict with me. When you engage with that and you're like, okay, I'm going to check in with you. Do you understand that what you did was very abnormal and inappropriate? And then they're going to be like, no, it wasn't. <laughs> no, it wasn't. And you're going to be like, okay, so you're acting a little strange. Do you, are you aware that you're acting a little strange, like different than normal? And then you can kind of engage in a conversation where you break it down with them and whether or not they can engage with you is going to be dependent on where they are themselves. It's like, a, it's like a, you guys ever get hangry? I get hangry. And when I'm hangry, I'm like a different person. I become like a monster. And then when I get my food in, I'm like, hello. Because my normal disposition as a person is like bubbly and hello. How are we? What are we doing? I'm like very, you know what I mean? It's only when I'm hangry or when I'm thinking very deeply that I'm like, this face. What? And I look like a bitch. Like I look, when I'm thinking, I look like a bitch. And when I'm hungry, I look like a bitch. But when I'm neither of those things, I'm like, la, 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 la. So when my partner has a conversation with me and I'm like this, he's like, are you thinking or hangry? And I'm like, if I don't eat in the next 30 minutes, I will divorce you. Do I mean that? No. Is it something I say? Yes. Do I mean it? No. I literally don't mean it. No part of me means it. And the reason he can be like, oh, that just means she's hangry and she doesn't really mean it is because he knows I'm a biological creature that needs food. And if you get me food, I'll remember how to evoke my free will and consciousness. It's why I really, my heart goes out to people who are starving, who are sleep deprived, who are mentally ill, because we do things that we would never have done if those things weren't taken care of. We, our bodies do things. This vessel malfunctions. It literally breaks down when it is not taken care of. And it will drive itself off the road and accidentally hurt other people. It is a true and just proven fact time and time again. If you watch 911 calls or listen to them, if you watch interrogation videos, if you watch people who have always been great their whole life have a complete snap, there's usually a lot of factors that lead into it. But people will do this. Because society has decided this individual is not a specific consciousness. Society has decided this individual is not a specific consciousness. And the society has decided this individual no longer gets to be treated like a person because they had a moment, right, where they were dangerous to themselves or others, which is fair as a society you're trying to help the hive the hive. You're not a person in a society. You don't exist in society. You don't. Until someone can look at you as an individual, but then what do they do? They make them out to be monsters. So the individual, according to society in that moment, becomes the monster. The bad guy. Instead of someone we could have all been. I was just watching Papa Gut before this, and he was reviewing a Columbine a critique of a person who was critiquing one of the mothers who did the Columbine tours, basically. She had a TED Talk and everything. And I don't know about this woman. She seems pretty suspicious. But she said something that I think is true, but coming from her makes it sound untrue, where she said, you know, you might not know what your kids are up to, which is true. Name, Listen to all the parents that are like, why are my kids into Andrew Tate? Listen to the school system that's like, whoa, why are my, parent, why are my kids into Andrew Tate? Parents can't always know what their kids are up to. They do their best, right? But basically, I think people have this illusion that like my kid never could never be a school shooter. See, I, as a, as a specific consciousness, knows my kid could end up being a biological misfunction or malfunction and could end up living in a society that identifies them as an individual that's dangerous and monstrous and then decides they can't be there anymore. Because my child is a biological creature who might not be able to evoke free will or might not be able or just might be able to evoke free will enough to become a terrorist or they might make a decision to hurt other people. And I agree with you that in a society, that person should be handled appropriately. And that energy that's creating conflict with other energy, we should do something with it. But not lose our humanity when we do that all the same. And everything we do is human, but I'm not sure that everything we do is as dignified as we want it to be 
I'm not sure we're really honest with how we handle the realities of how violent human beings can be, right? Because we always want to chalk it up to they're monsters, they're monsters. So I am well aware that I might have a child that becomes a monster, right? By society standards. And I have to decide what to do with that construct. Now, in my ideal world, right, we'd probably have some way to put them in a facility in which they are not abused, but humanized and people can visit them and love them even if their victims are now dead. Because again, we do believe in hurting and murdering each other. We go to war. Right now, there's a war and conflict happening in the world where people want you to pick sides and they want you to decide whose baby should die. And when you say, I'm not decided, I'm not, a, I think both sides have problems. They're like, oh, what? No, you have to pick one side to die. And I'm like, hmm, that's a weird conclusion to come to. Right? So I'm trying to see how do I harm reduce and how do I help the, like the most amount of human lives to survive? How do I do that? And it's trying to humanize the worst of us, but also understand that we could be this by just one, one bad biological mishap, by one car accident that fractures our brain, by one genetic mishap. Like we have to understand that you and I are the same because on the macro, we don't even exist because we're all balls of energy clashing up against each other. Right? It's only because society exists that we ostracize. Individuals get identified within the society. And then we decide to do what we want with those individuals that we've decided we don't like. Which is fair. Because as a biological species, it makes sense to do this. And I'm saying we could be more than our biology to an extent. Most people could be more than their biology. I think it's pretty, like it's an anomaly if you procreate correctly in the right circumstances without drugs in your system, without incest, without all of these things that you could create human beings that would have less chances of being those people in society that kind of go haywire. And it's different than being necessarily even a terrorist or a person with an ideology. If you have an ideology, then that comes from society. That doesn't come from a defect. Society breeds terrorism. Society breeds killers but not all killers. There is a specific kind of human that is a killer, that is a defect. And then there's a group of people that kill that are society because of ideology. So it's all killing, but even I am willing to admit that the ones that are a biological defect, we can talk about and easily figure out where to put them in society. But where do you put the majority of people that have an ideology that justifies their murder? Because the individuals that have the biological defect, which is assuming what it is, who actually have like something in their brain that doesn't allow them to kind of like make better decisions to some extent, well, they're very, very rare. But the ones that are big groups that justify murder on the mass scale because of ideology, they're you and me. They're everyday people. They're right next to you. They're on this Discord. They're on this chat. They're in my DMs right now. They're... They're us, society. That is what society is. Those individuals that are cre like serial killers, they're not part of society. The people going to war, the people funding wars, the people saying this side deserves to die and this side is their society, right? Society has justified mass murder because biologically it makes sense. I'm just saying, I believe you could be more than your biology if you go on an introspective journey, which you don't have to. And you won't because it's been determined for you because on the macro, you are little balls of energy floating through a universe and your ability to evoke free will is limited unless you go down an introspective journey and you go through and you realize you are a specific consciousness. That doesn't matter because you're a floating ball in the universe. <laughs> and until you go on that journey, humans are going to human. Everything that happens, every pain and suffering and joy and beauty and everything are humans being humans. It is what it is, right? Okay, let's get to questions and then we'll watch some stuff together. Okay, so sorry I ranted for so fucking long. Oh my God, how long was that? That was so long. Okay. I mean, if you're close with someone, you can understand the person outside of the social construct. You would think, societal construct, you would think. But people often don't. Let me send you a message my mother sent me today. 
My parents, as you guys know, I love them so much. They're what I call two Bs, and I think a majority of people are probably in the two B category, if I'm being honest. Um, though there's lots of two Cs in the world. Maybe there's more two Cs. I'm not sure. Um, let me say, let me tell you guys this like text message my mom sent me. And I think this is the sweetest message in the world, but it also is like some people would say, oh, NPC, but humans. This is like a human living in a bubble, right? And this is my mother's bubble, right? This is a well-meaning text message. And this is what all of you send me. When people are upset with me, they're like, Brittany, how could you not, how could you say this? The reason I say you sound like my mother is because you're basically re like reinforcing your bias and projecting it onto me and saying, don't you agree? You have to agree because I'm right. So the reason I look at people in the comments and I look at YouTubers who have problems with me is like, yeah, you're like my mother. A well-meaning, well-intentioned, wonderful human who I love so much and would never want harm to ever happen to her or you. But you're so in your own bubble, you can't even hear it when you speak. So listen to my beautiful mother, who's just like the most wonderful human who's ever existed. She go, she sends me a picture of there's like a phone tower in her neighborhood. And there's a guy on a crane working on the phone tower. It's not that big of a phone tower, but you know, it's pretty tall. It's like a disguised as like a fake tree. You guys ever seen those? She goes, so these guys got here about an hour ago in 57 degree weather. It's raining. I often think where are the feminists like Hillary Clinton and AOC who claim that women can do what men can do, but no, they can't. There's certain women, there are certain things women will never be able to do. And there are certain things men will never be able to do. Hold on. I'm trying to read her. Like she speaks into the phone. Cause you know, um, we are different. I thank God for good, strong men who are willing to do the dirty and hard work that women would never be able to do. God is good. And my mom wonders why her sons ended up being Andrew Tate fans. My mom is a wonderful person who lives in a society called Catholic and conservative. And she's an individual woman who's a Syrian, uh, a mom, a female. She's a homeschool mom, put her kids in public school eventually. She's a lot of things. She's a redhead. She's an elderly person now because she's in her 60s. She lives in a society that reinforces a belief that encourages encourages her to send me random text messages during the day but that say see how women claim they can do these things and i'm like i don't know what to do with this and then she asks me betty how could my sons love andrew tate how could my sons love these people these misogynists and i'm like ma'am what do you mean what do you mean you send me these text messages out of the fucking blue what do you mean That is what everyone sounds like to me. Most people sound like that. Most people can't even hear themselves. Most people can't even hear themselves and the way they facilitate and encourage these. That's why when people talk about rape victims and there's a thing in their voice that tells me, ah, oh, you're doing that thing. You're doing that thing where you're like, how could people think that? How could people think this about me? And I'm like, because it's the way you talk about it. And I get it. Everyone talks like that way to somebody, which is why you have to see the consciousness for the, who they are and decide, are you a societal, are you an individual living in a society or are you a specific consciousness? Because as a specific consciousness, I feel like everything we're doing is kind of a mess and we should be chilling, but we can't be chilling because everything we're doing is natural to us. But as a specific consciousness, like what's wrong is wrong is wrong and what's right is right is right and what is 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 is. My mom is technically right that it's great that we have men who do jobs that none of us want to do, even other men. It's wrong to think that women can't climb, can't do this, like the specific job though. And I don't know where Hillary Clinton and AOC come into it, but man, it's like a Tumblr post right here, right? Now, when we're talking about the bubbles, I want to show you guys a video I pulled up. Okay, hold on. Oops, I should have saved that. Damn it. I closed my... Oh, that was such a mistake. I closed my paint. Hold on. One of you in Discord, thank you so much. You took down the notes I was writing. I'm going to copy and paste it back into a paint program. Because i probably going to need to reference that again. Hold on. Let me show you this video. Just like a good example. And then I'm going to go through your comments because I'm so sorry. We're like... I'm so behind now. Okay.
Okay, thank you so much for making these notes. I stole them. Thank you. Um, and I took out your specific private notes on it. Thank you. Um, okay, go to TikTok. TikTok, view profile, favorites, video capture. Nope, that's wrong. YouTube capture, YouTube, this one. Okay. So you guys know, um, what's his name? Trey, Trey Kennedy. Okay, so Trey Kennedy is more conservative leaning, right? So he comes from a bubble, more leaning towards my mom and dad. He's more Midwesterner. They're more immigrant conservatives, which is specific. And I want you to see this, like, he's a comedian. He does some cute skits on YouTube. I've always liked his work. And at the same time, like, I know we, you know, we're different aligned probably politically. But here we go. Let's watch this video together where he gives a fake apology to some Twitter drama he had, uh, you know, bubble v bubble. That episode, I said something that uh, unfortunately a lot of people took the wrong way. And I looked up just turquoise hair. People with who dye their hair, I actually love it because like it's nice to know like immediately I don't want to talk to you. Oh no, the medium ugly man with brown hair and no jawline doesn't want to talk to me. Whatever will I do? You're the most uninteresting person. Sorry. <laughs> we don't want to talk. I think the funniest thing about this guy is he has a failed comedy career. Um, how's that working out for you, bud? I don't want to talk to a white dude with a podcast and a neck beard. Is your beard supposed to look like that? Like the... Hey, little guy. Nice neck beard. Don't go to a library, not that you would, because you seem kind of dumb, so that you don't have to interact with people. No one likes you now. You know, me personally as a comedian, I, I truly don't want to upset anyone. I, every week I just try to say things, to make people laugh, so... You know what, I, and I tell you what, I'd rather do anything than to upset this many people. Not to be drastic, but I'd rather die. My hair blue than to ever back down from that take. Y'all are crazy. Y'all are crazy. Yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. Oh, totally. Oh, yeah. Totally. I love the... I, I thought you were going to apologize. Can we, so. um, let's, let's talk off air really quick. Um, sub like, subscribe, correct opinions every Wednesday. In a recent episode, I... Okay, so obviously it's like a joke and like it's a bubble joke and they're all having fun against each other. Where do you think these women get off? Like what part of their brain is like, yeah, I'm going to get this guy back. He said he didn't want to talk to people with blue hair, which if you live in a society and you're an individual in a society, you actually know what stereotype he's talking about. And then they fulfilled the stereotype by acting exactly the way he meant to describe them. Like the irony is too good. It's why Fresh and Fit are so successful because what they do is they find specific women who are exactly the women they're talking about and complaining about and they bring them on Fresh and Fit and that reinforces the bubble's belief. Myron will do this very smart thing where he'll say, no, 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 I bring on college grads, international people, people from all over the world. Yes, Habibi. But you're going to individual bubbles and picking out the same kind of person from each bubble. Every bubble got a Miami girl. Every bubble has the kinds of girls Fresh and Fit make money off of. Every bubble has that girl in it, right? So you can grab women from all over the world and they're still the same category of woman, just different bubbles. Because society is made up of people and people mostly categorize similarly. It just looks different, right? That's why there's hippies in different bubbles. The hippies just look different. But it's the same kind of hippie. You know, it's why all those girls look the same. They all have plastic surgery and big butts and they all have like delusional relationship like ideas about their life and their, you know, whatever, whatever. And then Fresh and Fit bring them on and they're like, look, we're bringing diverse women into the panel. These are not diverse women. These are the same kinds of women, but are diverse within their category. That's like saying, oh, I have all kinds of cake here, but they're all different variations of chocolate. Where's the strawberry? Where's the coconut? Where's the vanilla? Like, where are the, where's the, you know, it's like, oh, I have dessert here. But it's like, yeah, but it's all, it's all pie. Where's the other kinds of dessert? It's like, well, I brought all kinds of desserts. It's like, yeah. So that's how I see the bubbles when I'm looking at them. And then the, you know, 
when I choose what bubble to socialize with or interact with, obviously I want a bubble that at least asks questions. That's like number one. And I want a bubble that's at least slightly more introspective, you know, but at the same time, it's still always like the societal bubble, which denies individuality, which is why when you break code with the society, they kick you out as an individual who's too rebellious. And then that rebellious person can form another bubble with other people, which is why I always tell you, I am not going to start up a community because the moment I even started throwing that idea around, I saw the little click starting and I saw the drama ensue. And I saw even my own spaces that I've created become like gossipy and betrayal and awful. And I was like, oh, stop. People just cannot handle it. Once I put people in a group, they just become the worst people. And I don't know what it is. But I figure it's because they're not all individually having relationships. Well, even if they were, because look, conflict is conflict is conflict. You can get two fives in a room who's going to have conflict because they're going to have different relationships to the biases of their bubbles and their life, even if they're both radically accepting that they're you know, like energy in a universe, right? Because what they're going to do to have a conversation, like I remember one time in the Discord, we tried to have an event of like three, four, five conversations versus two conversations, and they just sounded the same. Because there's no conversation to have when you're a five that isn't just like, yep, yeah, we're floating energy balls in the universe. So everyone's like, what's your opinion on this? We're floating balls in the universe. What do you think this should do? We're floating balls in the universe. You know what I mean? So like, it doesn't sound like anything. You almost have to become like a societal or a bubble person to have a conversation. Because there's really no conversation to have. At some point in the meditation like journey, you're just like, you don't even exist. Like nothing exists. So you're just like, yeah, cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like nothing is there, which is why it's awesome because then there's no violence there and no hate. You're just chilling. You're vibing. You're like watching the birds and you're like, you know, literally the only five convo is group breathing. Yeah. Like maybe group meditation, silent breathing, looking at the stars. Like there is no conversation, which is why like even my work, I have to engage with the bubbles and I kind of have to like form. I, that's why I have to like share some of my opinions, but also make it clear like it's just my opinions. Like, yeah, this is why wiser people talk less legit though. Like what is there to say? What is there to say? You know what I'm saying? Some of my favorite conversations are the ones where we haven't said a word. <laughs> some of my favorite moments are those silent moments, you know? Madison says, do you think the whatever podcast similar to Fresh and Fit Bubble does a better job of bringing on diverse groups of women on their podcast? Actually, this is going to sound, okay, can we talk about the race bubble? Let's talk about the race bubble and how it makes a difference and why it makes a difference. Okay. So, okay, if you go back to the chart I made, so the Fresh and Fit Bubble, okay, is black, is people of color right? Their hosts are black and they're going to have a different interaction with society because society has form formed constructs around race and the whatever podcast is white and that has formed a society around a construct. So technically you're going to get a different bubble because of the racial differences and the construct around race we've created of the different hosts. So fresh and fit, okay, are the same as the sa as as blacks and whites are the same. We're all energy floating in a universe. But as we biologically came to be and as we came together through evolution, we decided to create societies and societies have biases and prejudice and societies have things called racism. And society has decided to pull apart and it's funny a little bit that again, the ironies that fresh and fit bring on, what are they called? 405s, 403s, 402s. What is it called? 407s. I don't know what they're called. Okay. Which are like ho girls and baddies, that type of thing. And the whatever podcast though brings them on also brings on actual people who do like pro-life debates, actual people in activism. They bring on eight, three oh fours. Thank you. They bring on better guests from different bubbles because, and I think it's a racial component personally, and I don't mean this in a, in a progressive way or like on a race way. I mean, as like a, objective like societal individual way the whatever podcast has formed a society and appeals to parts of society that fresh and fit just cannot right 
So fresh and fit has to bring on certain kinds of girls that are okay being in that kind of an environment. But lots of the women that go on the whatever podcast are talked to like white women. And fresh and fit talk to women the way they talk about black women. Fresh and fit are so disgusting the way they talk about black women. And white society has had enough privilege that they they wouldn't accept that from Fresh and Fit. And also Fresh and Fit would be too pussy to go for white girls that way because they have that racial component of wanting to appeal to, but they can't reach it. it one day when Myron said, oh, I want to be as big as Joe Rogan, you will never be as big as Joe Rogan because you hate women and white people hate you. You are not nice to people and black women hate you. You're hated by so many groups, bros. Because like you're not, you're not. Joe Rogan is loved by, you might not like it, Women, black people, Asian people, people with disabilities, military people, hippies. Like Joe Rogan is universally liked by so many different diverse bubbles of ideas that there's enough of them together to get him the views he has. Fresh and fit, like who are they going to appeal to? And even the whatever podcast is only going to appeal to white people who are willing to tolerate it to a point and then they won't anymore. They won't tolerate it. So Joe Rogan, right, as much as I like Joe, I also like get frustrated sometimes because he's so in a bubble. I love it. Like he's so in a bubble. He's like a three who stays comfortably where he is and refuses to go to four, which is fine. He's so comfortably as a two, three. It's so amazing. He's like such a two, three. He's so comfortable there, which is good for him, right? But he is so good at bubble hopping with people. He's so good at having conversations with people. He's so likable and non-threatening. He doesn't insult. Can you imagine if Joe Rogan was saying to black women what Fresh and Fit say to black women? And the idea that Fresh and Fit, they think they could be as big as Joe Rogan. Who? You piss off everybody. Like you literally piss off every demographic. Who? Who? Who is going to? Who? Who? If you guys do want to hop in the Discord rating room, you can absolutely just hop in, especially if you're a content creator or um, if you're a part of the Discord, you can hop in. So content creators have special like perks. They can just hop right in there. And if you talk, I'll hear you. I'll just unmute myself. Um, but if you're uh, not a content creator and you're on the Discord, you can jump into my waiting room and I can pull you into the room if you want to talk about any of this. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Actually, your audio is like really good. Oh, good. Yeah. Can I introduce you and tell everybody who you are? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is Harmony. You guys know her from the panel that I just did on the BDSM stuff. She's also known as, um, can I tell them who you're known as in chat? Yeah. Okay. She's also known as Maiden in the chat. You guys see her often. She gives amazing super chats. She's got a great mind. And I assume you want to talk about philosophy, girl. Hit us. What's up? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, well, so I was just um... – taking note of how what you're how you're talking about free will really sounds a lot like um <laughs> excuse me there's this guy named drew highland and he talks about how humans are finite transcendence and so how you talk how you talk about like engaging with your free will sounds very much like the transcendent side you know we can overcome our self-deception we can like be better make better choices mm. you know get better from our mental illnesses you know, we can self-transcend, but we're also like these finite creatures. You know, we die. We're mortal. Um, we're subject to fate on a major scale. Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, the bodies we're given and all that uh, influence, you know, I think how. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to like say like the one thing that I, I think is probably scary for people to engage with is be is like how short our time is here. You know, a lot of people, I'll, I'll see people that are like, oh, we have such a long time on earth. And I'm like, I don't know about you, girl, but I'm running out of time. I was like, what is time? Like, there's so many things I'm not going to know by the time I die. And I think that is so scary to engage with. And at the same time, it's so freeing because it means like you don't have to worry. You're never going to figure it out anyways. But also like enjoy figuring it out while you're here. And I think like while you're here, you get to decide what do I actually want to spend time on? And I think people forget like you can spend time on so much or so little just depending on how you want to do it you know what I mean like either yeah. facing your your mental illness whether you're being introspective whatever you're doing by the way how do you spell Drew's last name do um, you know 
Y L A N D, I think. True. Is it Highland or Highland? Highland, Highland. It's pronounced Highland, but it's Highland. Okay, cool. I'll definitely check that out. Yeah. That's so interesting, actually. But I think it's like, do you think it's just um Oh my God, Joy, give a super chat and your name, Maiden, says, I love Maiden. Oh. Yay, Joy. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Yay. So what do you think about- yeah, I, just see con- I just see convergence. And I mean, it's always like so like uh, interesting to me, the, the different ways that your philosophy converges with all these other little, you know, things that I'm learning about. So okay, I just but- had to put my two cents in. No, I love that. And you know what's funny about that is, again, there's this narrative in the bubbles that like, oh, Brittany thinks she's discovering something new. And I was like, nope, just trying to explain that it's already here and it's already been here and all the answers are already there and we're just ignoring them because it's too exhausting to do the research and also like like actually want to change as people. And I think that's some, some, like somehow beautiful that other people are doing exactly what I've been doing but calling it different things. And you know how like you're so good at Verveki? I'm so bad at Verveki. Like I'm so <laughs> bad at like referencing his words and getting his definitions down. But then I realized like in the same way that I struggle to keep up with Verveki, like referencing them, that's how people must feel about all my words where they're like, Brittany, yeah. use language I know. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like we're all doing it to each other. We're all creating words that mean the same thing, but we're explaining it in different ways to different people. Yeah. We only have so much capacity to actually like, super get into like other people's points of view to be able to truly understand them. And you know what's so funny is I've been thinking about like how to, you know, when people hear somebody generalize it and they use it in like everyday people words, then it just sounds like you're selling a book. And so I wonder if people use their own language. So it doesn't exactly sound like you're selling a book, but then it ends up selling, sounding like you're selling a book. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It probably all sounds like that to somebody depending on their bubble. Yeah, for sure. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I think about that a lot too. Like to me, you're, you make a lot of sense. I get what you're saying. Like it makes sense just from my perspective. So who knows if I'm actually getting it, but uh, there's other people I'm like, I have no idea what they're talking about, but uh, yeah, I'll leave that to somebody else to figure out. Exactly. Exactly. Leave it to somebody else. Like that's why I want to, I don't think it's bad to have bubbles because like every bubble gives you different tools, which is why fives end up in bubbles who like specific language. As you know, like we all end up like everyone ends up in their own language bubble. Yeah. You know, know, I was thinking about that because there's like a few people that I know. I was talking to Slicks about this, someone else from the discord. And there's like a few people who like, are coming from their own bubble that is like drastically, drastically different than mine. Um, Most people like that, I kind of am content to like, let them do their own thing. But then there's some people where I just feel, I don't know, like drawn to them. Like I kind of, I want to understand, like I want to embody their perspective. Like I want to take that, I want to do the work to like figure that out. Yeah. I think that's love. I think that's love or something like that at least is it like about being seen kind of love yeah like I actually really want to see them you know and so I'm willing to like do the work to try to communicate myself in a way Mm -hmm. that they can understand that I'm trying to see them you know you know what I mean I don't know it's like it's kind of complicated when it like in actual practice but there's like few moments that I've had where it's like uh, I don't know, just in like discussions with people where I just have this like epiphany moment where like all of a sudden I feel like, oh my gosh, like I can see you. You know, I didn't, I thought I yes. could, and now I can see this yes. part or like a part or something. Oh my gosh. I'm that's like a moment of love or something. I don't know. Like maybe that sounds cheesy, but no, it yeah. is. I, that happened to me on the chat the other day where somebody I think it was yesterday right where somebody said something and I was like I don't get it and then something else happened and I was like oh I get it and it feels automatically like now we're connected because we can see each other and it feels like uh, wonderful I'm actually having a struggle right now where there's this person and I feel like I cannot see them so they feel very weird to me and I almost want to engage with it but then when I do they make me feel like so almost 
unnerved because a part of me is like, I can't tell if they're lying so much to themselves or if I'm not able to see them. And then that's the question I have to do when I'm researching like or judging a person. Is it me that can't see them or are they lying so much to themselves? I can't get through to the real part of them. I contemplate those things all the time and I don't know how to figure that out, honestly. I don't know if I'm wise enough. You know, I just give it time, girl. I think time gives us all the answers, you know. Eventually, <laughs> they'll say something that clicks in my brain. <laughs> yeah. People expose themselves for good or ill. They do. They really do. They really do. But. Yeah. Anyway, I think that's all that's on my noggin right now. All right, girly. So. Thank you for calling in. Yeah. Anytime. Thank Love you. you. Bye. Bye. Okay, so – love that you guys can do call-ins um if you're a content creator and you have permissions you can just hop in or if you're part of the discord just sit in my waiting room and i'll pull you in um what i want to do is i want to talk about uh determinism well i want to watch determinism um it's a conversation actually on the carefree wondering uh channel do you guys know him i love him he's such vibes and um he talked to Robert Sapolsky, 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 and he just came out with a book, which I've bought on audiobook. I'm going to start listening to it, and I'm really excited about it because um, he's, like, very popular on the internet. Everybody knows his lectures. Well, everybody in the free will versus determinism debate <laughs> knows his lectures, and I just listened to the first, like, 15 minutes on my own, and I was like, oh, this is fire. I should listen to it with everybody, so I just thought we'd go through it a little bit and see how we like it. And introduce you to a bubble you might not know already. A few days ago, I had the extraordinary opportunity to speak to Robert Sapolsky, the biologist, neurologist, anthropologist from Stanford University, who is one of the major scientists today. And he spoke to me about his new book, Determined. I have the printout here, published by Penguin Press. And we'll post this video as soon as the book will be available. It's a wonderful book that argues very effectively from a scientific perspective against a still very dominant notion of free will and what we could call with Jordan Peterson sovereign individuality. The main point of the book is to show that human behavior, including the intentions that inform it, is based on biological and other environmental conditions. But the book actually does much more than presenting this claim. It also outlines how not only biological reality, but reality as a whole, including social and psychological reality, unfolds mm. as emerging complexity. Sapolsky argues both for an understanding of reality based on complexity and against the reigning paradigm of free will. In this way, his work connects very well, if I may say, for instance, with Niklas Luhmann's social systems theory, and mm. with arguments defending a morality I presented in other videos on this channel. But let's listen to Robert Sapolsky now. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Sapolsky, for, for joining me to talk about uh, your book. It's really, really a great honor. Uh, I have to say, though, that uh, I didn't read your book out of free will. It was uh, <laughs> uh, suggested to me by by two close friends, Paul D'Ambrosio, who also uh, is my co-author, and my friend Milos Rancic. So they brought me to your work, and I'm I'm really grateful to them for that. The book has a double meaning. The book title has a double meaning determined, as you say. And uh, the first uh, meaning is basically that human behavior is determined. Maybe you can speak about that first, the first meaning of the title. Sure. Um, you know, there's obviously been just a few thousand years worth of people fighting over the free will issue. And most of what modern biology uh, is offering is there's a lot less free will than most people assume and that we run our societies on. Um, I happen to be way, way in the lunatic fringe um, and that I believe that there's no free will whatsoever. Um, and that's the main argument of the book. And much of what I'm doing in there is trying to go through the nuts and bolts of how we wind up with the brains that we have at this moment. And it's the outcome of influences and in biology a second ago, a minute ago, an hour ago, a lifetime ago, a century ago, and so on. And that when you really see the pieces of that come together, there's simply no room 
for the type of free will that people propose, one which, I'm not trying to sound sarcastic here, but one which requires you invoking magic at some point along the way. Um, and Now, okay, right there. He says one that has you evoking magic. Is Robert falling in? Is Robert saying, is Robert mocking in that moment woo-woo people or God, right? Or is he trying to say that there is no magic um, and that there is no relationship outside the macro like I described? So I gave my argument and I don't know what he's going to say necessarily, even though I've watched the first 15 minutes on this. But again, when he says that, what bubble is he making fun of? Right? What bubble is he referencing? What I try to do in the first half of the book is look at all the contemporary philosophical arguments for free will existing. And these are uniformly compatibilist views. Philosophers who say, yes, 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 I admit the world is made out of atoms and cells and stuff like that. I'm not saying it's all made out of like magic stuff, but somehow here's why you can still have free will amid us being biological machines. And mm -hmm. where I think every single one of those approaches has a fatal flaw in it when you know enough of the relevant science. Um, the second half of the book, in a sense, is building on the other way of thinking of the word determined, which right. is like to apply yourself to a difficult task, which is you know, essentially, I've believed since I was 14 years old that there's no free will at all. Mm. And ah, Hada says, I took it as free will as a form of magic, that we need God or magic to believe in it. Okay, noted. Mm. I'm totally intellectually at peace with that. It's straightforward. It's simple, all of that. But at the same time, I have absolutely no idea how we're supposed to live if everyone right. stopped believing in free will and how we're supposed to function. And the second half of the book is... Which is sort of ironic because I think most people, if they were honest, they don't believe we have free will because they they believe they believe in it in the way that they believe like I'm a good, like everyone's a good person, everyone's a bad person. Like do, do, hold on, let me, let me listen to that. Idea how we're supposed to live if everyone right. stopped believing in free will. So people will freak out and be like, oh, my God, how am I going to live in a world where I don't think we have free will? I don't think people right now really believe that they have free will, not even the religious people that say they do. Because, again, if you're ostracizing your gay kids and punishing them for being gay because they won't get it to heaven, you don't believe in free will because you didn't let them choose God. You decided to choose for them, right? Like you don't even believe in free will. When people say, like, I believe in free will, like, I don't even believe they really do. I think I would argue that a majority of society doesn't actually live like they have free will. They punish other people like other people have free will. Other people have free will. Other I don't, though. That's what society has. So society has other people are monsters, not me. Most people will not take responsibility or admit that they are engaging in free will when shit hits their fan. But when someone else is, oh, they're, 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 they're evoking free will. When someone else is a racist, they're evoking free will. But when you are a sexist, no, that's just like, that's just how it is as society. I'm just doing what's this. I'm just doing. So how do religious people define free will versus your definition of free will? Religious people will say free will is making a choice, a choice to choose God. I say free will is engaging with actually doing what makes sense outside of what's been told to you by the bubbles. Free will to me is engaging with actually stepping out of the shame of the bubble and the force of your biology and sort of all of those things. Now, even though we're biological creatures, I do think there's a consciousness that exists outside of that biology. 
and sort of interacts with that biology. That's what I think this person is who's talking to you, right? But this person who's talking to you doesn't exist on the macro. She only exists on this particular, in this particular context, right? So I only exist right now. When I turn off this computer and you forget I exist, I don't exist anymore, right? I, I'm, you don't even know if I'm dead. Like you don't even know when I click off stream every night, you have no idea if I'm going to die and you're not going to see me tomorrow. And by the way, I'm, I'm just going to be recycled energy in the universe. So the universe still sees me as nothing because it doesn't identify me, but it also knows I'm still there because I'm floating in the universe in a way. So when religious people say they have free will, they have free will to choose God and I have free will to choose no shame from the bubble, right? Like nothing. Like you're sitting in a room and people are like, choose a side. And you're like, mm, no, I'm going to walk away. And everyone's like, you can't just walk away. And I'm like, everybody should just walk away. But not walk away and harbor feelings and start conniving against each other and start creating. Just walk away. It doesn't matter. You're making up this conflict. This conflict is a construct created by your biology, so your feelings, your mental illness, so your mental health, right? Like the destruction of your life, everything that's been before you, everything generational. They say people have generational trauma and that's a real thing we're seeing through science. That if your ancestors were afraid of certain kinds of animals, you have a pre, um, a pre, um, a predisposition to also be afraid of that animal. So in so many ways, like that, that is like that is the trap of biology. But I think you can overcome that. I think you can have a relationship with that. I think you can literally say, okay. I know biologically speaking, I have a predisposition to be afraid of dogs and I'm going to fight that fear instead of giving into it and having a relationship with it. But I'm not going to treat it as just like a textbook. Oh, like my generational biology. I'm actually going to have a relationship with the reality that like, holy shit, if I don't engage with this, I'm going to have a little bit like limited relationship with my consciousness to an extent. And how we're supposed to function. And the second half of the book is some very pathetic attempts at getting at what things don't you have to worry about if magically everybody stopped believing in free will where justice would come from what what the differences would be again if everyone believed or realized on the macro we don't have free will because we're just energy clashing into itself and then on the micro we have engagement of free will based off of like societal constructs i genuinely think if i'm being honest with you if people radically accepted that, I think we'd stop having children and we'd probably move towards a society of making it really great for the people who are here and figuring out like who are the people that genuinely have like problems and where we put them? Like what kind of a garden like facility do we make for them to chill in away from like other people? Because like again, we're talking about the biological defects of a brain that causes you to snap and like kill people. We're talking about the societal pressure from culture that encourages you to be a terrorist, which is very common in societies all over the world. We encourage like, gang behavior is just culture. It's not like it's just a part of like the expected version of surviving. Like you can that's not a psychopath. Like people who are part of gang violence aren't psychopaths. They're just people who have a belief system. When you're in the military, you're not necessarily a psychopath. You're just a person with a belief system. When you're fighting, you're saying like, who do we choose, Israel or Gaza or like, I'm sorry, Israel or Palestine? That's not, like, those are terrorism and politics. That's part of ideology. That's a construct that was created by people who decided this is how we're going to live life. Even though people don't want to live that life, you do to an extent don't know how to engage with your free will enough to not live that life right? But they're not psychopaths. They're not like defective in the brain. They're just lacking introspection and free will. And the free will they have is to make a decision to survive, which is technically not free will. Like he's saying, it's biology, right? Um, and at the end, I conclude that, well, even though it's unimaginably difficult to really live as if you don't believe in free will and to have everybody else doing the same, mm -hmm. um, as people believe less and less in free will as we understand more. I think you do it really well when you're alone. When you're alone, it's really easy to live that way. When you're engaging with people, your biology kicks in, which is not a part of your free will, and you have an instinct to do something different. I actually think it's easy to live like there is no free will when you're alone and also easier to engage in free will when you're alone. <laughs> 
proper, the scientific bases of where human behavior is coming from, um, all that's going to happen is the world is going to become a better, more humane place. Right. Um, if I might go back to the first uh, meaning of the title, the, uh, your uh, point that human behavior is basically thoroughly determined, and you're using one core metaphor right at the beginning of the... Really fast, I want to say this. Andrew Tate couldn't have been anyone but Andrew Tate. Sneeko couldn't have been anyone but Sneeko. They don't have the free will to be anyone but those people. Just like I have no free will to be anyone but Brittany because I'm just energy floating through the universe and I'm clashing and we're creating conflict together. But I am this biological made up person. This And then when you evoke your consciousness, I think you're having a deeper relationship. Again, let's go. Where's my little paint chart here? Hold on. This is going to be a long day. Where's my little paint chart here? Hello, ma'am? <laughs> okay, hold on. I need to do something. I need to create a second scene. Window capture paint. Okay. Okay. So when you go back to my little chart that I made for you guys, okay? So <clears throat> the numbers represent my level system and then the hierarchy of society and the idea of like macro. On the macro, we don't exist. Andrew Tate and Sneeko don't exist on the macro because they're just energy balls floating through the universe, right? Based. Love that. And then, of course, oop, hold on. Where's my – hold on. Okay. And then, of course – as we come down to society, Andrew Tate and Sneeko do exist in society and we know them and we name them as individuals in the society, but they lack a specific consciousness. They lack like a relationship with their specific consciousness, which is why to us they're just individuals living in a society. But once again, if you evoke your individual consciousness, you also are evoking the reality to some extent that we're, we're also on the macro. Now, uh, specific consciousness, I think, can be engaged with um by twos and threes but it's it's very well maybe just threes maybe just three fours and fives i don't know we're gonna put that in parentheses because now i have to think about it more but andrew tate and sneak are individuals in societies but they're only here they don't have a relationship with their specific consciousness as far as we know. And then on the macro, they certainly don't realize. So they can't be anyone but themselves. They don't have the free will. They don't have the ability to engage with being anybody but who they were. Now, even if they change and have a relationship with their specific consciousness, still to the macro, they're just like balls of energy clashing in the universe. Like we're not individual people. We don't exist. We're all a shared consciousness in a way, right? But if you come down to the macro, the way we perceive reality, this thing I called YouTube and this thing that I'm doing here on this computer, then I know I'm a specific consciousness, but I know I also exist in a way much more than even Sneeko exists. Even though Sneeko exists, he can only be the version that he is right now because the amount of free will he can engage with is very limited. But ultimately, he doesn't even really have it because we don't even exist on the macro. The book, the turtles all Wait, the way where's down. where's the video? Hold on. I got to switch. My bad. Hold on. Um, uh, My bad. Hold on. Okay. Oh. Um, can you say a little bit more about that maybe? Okay. It's, it's this obviously made up story about the philosopher William James, but it could be any philosopher, but it's always some prestigious old white male um, is giving a lecture about the nature of the universe. And afterward, this old woman comes up and says, Professor James, you've got it all wrong. The world is actually on the back of a turtle. Right. And Professor James is sort of amused and says, oh, but madam, where does that turtle stand? And she says on top of another turtle. And he says, oh, but madam, where does that turtle stand? And she says, no use, Professor James, it's turtles all the way down. Right, exactly. And this is this is the starting point. Yes. Basically, the starting point is if it's ridiculous when trying to figure out what made us who we are, if it's ridiculous to say it's turtles all the way down, it is way more ridiculous to say instead that somewhere down there is a turtle floating in the air. 
Right. And that's what the free will concept is basically dependent upon. Right. At some point, there is a uncaused cause exactly. that steps out of all of this. Right. That's the old chain. Aristotelian conception that's uh, always in there. Well, you look at it. It's turtles, Adam, does that turtle stand? And perhaps you've got it all wrong. William, it's this obviously made up story about the philosopher William James, but it could be any philosopher, but it's always some prestigious old white male um, is giving a lecture about the nature of the universe. And afterward, this old woman comes up and says, Professor James, you've got it all wrong. The world is actually on the back of a turtle. Right. And Professor James is sort of amused and says, oh, but madam, where does that turtle stand? And she says, on top of another turtle. And he says, oh, but madam, where does that turtle stand? And she says, no use, Professor James, it's turtles all the way down. Right, exactly. And this is this is the starting point. Yes. Basically, the starting point is if it's ridiculous when trying to figure out what made us who we are, if it's ridiculous to say it's turtles all the way down, it is way more ridiculous to say instead that somewhere down there is a turtle floating in the air. Right. And that's what the free will concept is basically dependent upon. Right. At some point, there is a uncaused cause exactly. that steps out of all of this. Right. That's the old chain. Aristotelian conception that's uh, always in there. Well, you look at various points where people who think about this stuff professionally believe they have come up for with an explanation for where a behavior has come from because of the elevated levels of this hormone, because right. of this mm -hmm. version of this gene, right. because of, you know, expansion of the neural connections in this part of the brain, some such thing. And what you get to at every one of those points is saying, great, but where did that come from? And where did the thing that came from come from? And it's, you know. Yeah, okay, so this is the part where they kind of lose me. Because again, and not to brag, but I actually think my ideas are a little bit better. And I'm not saying that they haven't like talked about my ideas. But again, like this is me engaging with my work. Z King, thank you for the super chat. Turtle take over. Let's go. I really think it's how we're engaging with these things. So once again, I think the turtle thing is the – my brain doesn't work that way. My brain works with, like, what do we know? And, yes, I agree that our biology plays a role and the way we see the world plays a role and our brain plays a role and what we're comprehending plays a role. But I don't understand how we're not having that lived – and maybe – okay, here's my theory. Okay, the people I know, some of the people that I know who are into determinism aren't also into spirituality or metaphysics. And again, it's because they're not relying on the woo-woo, which is totally fine. But I think when you engage enough with the woo-woo, you open up a new level of knowledge that, again, isn't about magic. It's about the brain. Meditation is about the brain, right? Like the brain, okay? So when you look at the world... And you say, yes, on the macro, we are just like floating particles in space and we're having like, we're all just energy. When we die, we get recycled back. We're energy. There's no need to talk about free will when it's all determined that we're going to die. Fate and destiny are pulling us in a direction. We don't, what is even free will, right? But because we are biological creatures that probably evolved over time, we don't know. We formed what we call societies, and those societies do trap us in bubbles and dictate to us how to have emotions, how to feel about things, how to think about things, right? That's okay. That's normal. That's human, right? And then within that society, you have key individuals that become like real characters to us, right? And that's great too. But then outside of that, where I think you are playing with real sort of free will to an extent, you're playing with specific consciousness. And specific consciousness is a little bit different. And it's not about pretending to know. It's radically accepting that I don't. And it is saying I want to do something different. It is kind of saying like I want to float in the air. It is kind of saying like, um, yeah, I'm just going to do something else. Even though my biology is telling me to do one thing. And even though the world is telling me to do one thing. And even though, even though, even though, I'm not going to do it. Like I'm going to do something else. And people are like, you can't just do that. And I'm like, watch me. 
right? Which sounds woo-woo or sounds like, oh, but you're not really doing it. But I actually think meditation is a form of knowing, okay? And we're heading for knowledge here. That's what we're going for. But because, again, we're so limited, I am not going to throw my eggs in the basket and say that we don't have free will. What I'm going to say is there is a biological component. And I think if you evoke introspection to such a degree, right, you can engage with free will in a very profound way. And I'm going to tell you this right now. I don't often do it every day, minute of every day. I never do it every minute of every day, evoking free will. When I'm hangry, I'm not talking about free will in the way that is profound and in the way that is specific. Everyone engages with free will on a spectrum. Some people, little to none. Some people, many, right? And I think in those moments of many, you're living in the literal philosophical present, meditative present, and you are actually making a decision off the information like playing God, right? But if you lose things and you lose yourself, then you become insane type thing, right? Brittany, are you assuming these things are outside of our biology, but they aren't? Nothing is outside of our biology and nothing is outside of our universe. So the universe is like this biological bubble or this little living entity or space, which is like this dead, but yet somehow living entity, right? And so I think what we're doing is we have very limited information and we're still doing the very human thing of assuming that we know the present day science, as he said, the present day science. Do we think we actually have the present day science to explain the free will or not free will argument? It's still a belief, which is fine. And I agree from a meditative perspective that on the macro, there is no free will, that I am i couldn't have been Brittany or I couldn't have been anyone but me, right? Because of my biology and my brain and everything. But I also think on the macro, you can engage with free will that allows you to pull away from all the expectation. It allows you to do the things that is very hard for other people to do because other people are not activating their free will. They are so engaged with their feelings. Like yesterday, I get like when I get these messages from people that are like, Brittany, like walking away is not an option. Being neutral about a situation is not enlightened. You think it's better to pick a side of whose children should die more? You think it is more enlightened? To pick a side so other people's kids die and yours don't. That's what we're calling enlightenment. And the irony is they're so perfectly exhibiting society versus the individual. So they are looking at me as an individual, not a specific consciousness. And they're saying, hey, society needs you to pick whose children we want to die in this curtain war conflict. And I say, as a specific consciousness, I don't want anyone's kids to die. And they say, no, that's not an option. And as an individual in our society, you need to pick one. And I say, as a specific consciousness, I decline. And then society decides on whether or not they're now going to kill me because I didn't want to decide which one, which, whose kids to die, like whose other kids I should di- like want to die, right? Because we form societies that are about survival and rooted in fear, we want everyone to pick sides so we know if we can feel safe with them. And then we look at individuals like monsters because they don't want to kill other people's kids, they want to kill possibly our kids. But what if we thought here killed no one's kids? Could that be an option? And they're like, no, that's not that option. So when I hear people talk about free will, yes, I think in these instances, society doesn't, you don't exist in society. You're not even a real person in society. There is no free will to evoke. Society cannot evoke free will. Hordes don't evoke free will. Hordes panic together. It's only when you have an individual on a spectrum, you can evoke free will. And then as an individual consciousness, you can step outside of it all and be like, "Mm, no. Now, again, even if you're a specific consciousness, that doesn't mean you're not a slave to your biology. My mental health triggers not eating enough food. Girl, sometimes I just haven't had enough food today. That is me not evoking free will because now I my body is shutting down and my consciousness is like so focused on just getting my body running. It's not thinking about anything else, right? It's something different, okay? So again, what I'm talking about versus I think what they're talking about is like, yes, on the macro, I completely agree with them. And I think even within society, I agree with them. What is free will in society? How could it exist? But an individual has spectrums of free will, right? And that's something different. I think that's something different. Um, Maiden says, I do think our consciousness emerges from 
all of the infinite relationships that cause and make up our own brain and body. Body is an extension of the brain and not separate. Body is an extension of the brain and not separate. Yes, uh, from my language, I have to separate everything into categories. So I do separate the brain and the body because they do different things in the same way that I would say an arm is not a leg, but I agree that it's all a body. Like if that makes sense. I agree it's all a body. Uh, Just to clarify my language in case that was confusing to anybody. Okay, so let's keep going. This infinite regression of, you know, turtles all the way down, each one having a, a predecessor basically saying, why is it that we're here right now because of what came before and what came before that and so on. And at some point, this gets completely out of control and we're back to the Big Bang. And that's like, who wants to go anywhere near that? Um, But for my purposes, it's preceding influences back a couple of million years, explaining why we evolved to be the sort of species we are. Right. Back a bunch of centuries, explaining what sort of culture we were raised in, back to when we were just our genome, back to when we were in a womb, and so on. So I don't know if we need to go back to the Big Bang, but when you look at the range of things influencing, shaping who we are, and let's make a mechanistic definition of that, shaping the brain that you have at this instant when you will do or not do some particular behavior, all it is is what came before. Right. So there's like some theories that like we're just reaction to reacting to reacting to reacting. And I think I've been in state of my life where that was true. But I really, I really feel like somehow in my, again, this could just be anecdotal and I could be tricking myself with my biology and all this stuff or whatever that means because we're biological creatures. But with the tools that I have, I really do think I have meditated myself into a place temporarily, not all the time, not every day, temporarily into a place of what I would call free will in a very profound way, like true free will, like full free will, maybe full because it's a spectrum, maybe like full free will, like in a moment. But it's very rare and it's just in a second. And I think it's sort of like living in the actual present, which you cannot do when you're having conversations like this. You cannot do it when you're exist. I can't do it now. I cannot live in the present right now, not in the therapy way, in the philosophy way, because right now I'm thinking of pressing play in the video. I'm thinking about how I have to pee. I'm thinking about my discord. I can't be in the present right now because I'm too busy working. And in order to work within a society or within a mechanism of a job, which is a construct, you actually can't. Society isn't set up to live in the present. Society isn't set up to actually evoke free will. Right. Society isn't set up for the whole world just to sit on grass and meditate and consume only when necessary. Right. Society is set up in these ways, which is like fine, because, again, it's just like where society is to buy and sell things, to go to war, to kill other people's children. Like that's just how it goes to kill our own children. Right. That's just how it goes. And we dignify it in a way by saying, well, that's just what I have to do in this moment. And it's a part of my values and my group is being discriminated against. So it's okay. And we do this game and it's going to cycle through every generation forever. So it doesn't even matter what came before. I mean, it's a cool concept of like, where were we two million years ago? Where are we now? Where are we now? Now at this very moment in time, I can't even get society to pause for a moment. It's so angry with itself, like normal. There's always a part of society that's happy and joyous and everyone's great. And there's always a part of society that is like the angry, we're angry, we're angry. And they have a reason to be angry because on their micro experience, they're experiencing a lot of pain. Your pain is valid. And yet the hardest part of this and the part that might make people upset is all of it is self-inflicted. So on the macro... We are all like sharing a consciousness because we're all part of the same like group of energy that's floating around the universe and bumping into each other, right? So on the macro, we are all just shared and recycled energy floating through the universe, knocking up against each other. We're the same. But when society formed itself through our biology and the trap of that, we decided to have enemies and people we were afraid of. And then we decided to, as groups of societies, bomb other societies or hurt other societies, or as individuals, 
decide to group with other identities and hurt each other, but specifically as societies. This is my society and this is your society and we're going to fight and it's self-inflicted. But it's not self-inflicted, meaning that they know they're making the choice. They don't have enough introspection or free will to know they're actually doing it. They don't actually know they're doing it. They only know that they feel like they should do it and they have to do it and there's no other choice. It's not like they're evoking free will to such an extent that they're like, oh, I could just not do this. They don't even know they don't have to do it. They only know they have to do it, which is why when you take sides in a war, like if somebody asked me, Brittany, take a side in a war, truly, like truly take a side in the war. I'd be like, okay, well, in order to take a side in a war, I would have to forget that I'm floating energy in the universe and I'd have to go down to society level and say, what bubble do I live in? And as an individual, how will that society treat me? And then pick the society. So the group of people, and when you're talking about society, you're talking about a group of people that basically eradicate the individual. So I have to pick a society that when they see me, they don't ostracize me as an individual. I'm not actually picking those humans over those humans because I actually think one human is bad or good in a real way. I'm choosing the society of people that aren't going to pick me as the next target in a real way because no matter what society you're in, because I think most people are good people because they're just like biological creatures engaging with limited free will and limited introspection. And then they're doing what they think is normal to them. Because remember, cultures, like like religious groups, they're not psychopaths. They're cultural. Their belief, they hold a belief that justifies murder. But they're not psychopaths. So I can reason with them by engaging with them in a way that says like, I am not your enemy. Don't kill me but I have to convince them not to see me as the enemy by figuring out where do I fit in the world because they cannot view me as an individual consciousness because they can't even view themselves that way. They are a X group. They are this group. And yes, when I'm in politics, same thing. Politics season is coming up in the US. And in that sense, I'm not pro-conservative. I'm pro like liberal uh, progressive, right? I'm a queer person. I'm what society calls an Assyrian. I'm what society calls a queer person. I'm what society calls a woman. And so when I'm hanging out in this society, I have to do this. But if I go back to the specific consciousness and then I go back into the macro, I'm a floating like ball of energy that's clashing with other floating balls of energy. Does that make sense? So there is no like, oh, imagine if society could live as if There's no free will. There is no society that lives as if there's no free will because there's no society that lives as if they're floating energy balls of consciousness. There's no society that comes together and isn't coming together because of biological need. There is no like free will evoking because they're not living a specific consciousness. Like they're not a specific consciousness. So when people say like there's no free will, black and white, I would argue there's no free will on a spectrum And in society, you can't have free will because no one exists in society. You only exist as the thing called society, but society isn't a person. Society is a construct of people hurting together because of biology, which is very different. Discord says, do you have a goal to live your life more as a five and less engaged with society? Yes. Obviously, like My goal is to be able to breathe. My goal is to get to a point in life where I can just breathe, meaning meditate, meaning exist without fighting existence every moment. But right now I'm not in that place because I'm in a place called society and society has this rule that as an individual, this is how they're going to treat me and then I have to play this game with them. But like my heart's not in it, kids. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to like sit here and decide who's better and who's da da da. I don't want to do that game. I just want to chill and hang out with my family and eat some fucking pie and have a dog and watch some anime and chill, right? So yeah, my goal is to live, I wouldn't call it being like more of a five because fives can live within society. I would say specifically, I want to live as a specific consciousness in a bubble that allows me to breathe, right? Because fives can engage in politics all the time. Fives can jump down into two bubbles, but I want to live like a real, I want to I wanna be able to live in the world 
with a certain level of comfort and safety that allows me to breathe, right? That's kind of my goal, you know? People are biologically wired to herd in groups of 100 or so, according to Homo sapiens book. Nations are unnatural. Um, But nations aren't really more than that, are they, though? Because even when you belong to a big society, you're still herding in groups. We are Americans. What kind of Americans are we? Because if you go city to city within a 15-mile radius, you're getting different herds of humans. So I would argue that we actually are doing that. We're just doing it in bigger ways. But if you go to the macro, people are doing that. Like I'm from Southern California and Southern California is very conservative. And there's three conservative counties, Riverside, San Diego and Orange County. And all of them are very different. And then within Orange County, every single block could be very different. So I would say that we are exhibiting those differences. We're just coming together in very like rough ways or even here in Croatia. I'll be driving in Croatia. No, I'll be walking in Croatia. And literally every block, every like two to three blocks, you're, it's so different, right? <clears throat> every two to three blocks, you can tell different herds live here. Different parts of society live here. But society as a whole still exists. So there's society, the bigger bubble, Croatia. Then there's society, spaces in Croatia. And then there's neighborhoods in Croatia that is specific, right? So I think we are doing that thing. We're just, it depends on what lens we're looking at, right? Brittany, were you always able to be alone even in your 20s because I suffer being alone, which for me feels like I'm suffocating myself? No, in my 20s, it was so difficult being alone. I hated being alone. In my 20s, I never was home. I was always out with people. I was always looking for people. I was always socializing. I hated being alone. When I was home alone, that's when I self-harmed. I would hate myself. I would, I just hated being alone. I was so needy, so desperate, right? Like, no, I hated being alone in my 20s. Until I hit 30, from eight years old until 30, I was in complete struggle with my life as a consciousness and with ex radically accepting that like I don't even exist on the macro. I was in complete turmoil, a complete war with myself and going through the journey of radically accepting. Okay, so welcome to the journey, my bros. You have to make it through to the other side, which is a part of actually aligning with the reality and understanding it, right? It's a journey. Absolutely, I was never, I would, no, until 30. I'm very new. I'm a baby, baby five, right? Like I'm a little, I'm like in the beginning journeys. Like I'm a baby, baby. Like I'm a student. Right. I've just done more than some other people in this regard or I'm on this specific journey and it could help you, could not help you. I don't know your journey. Right. Oh, my gosh. Welcome to the memberships and yay. Welcome. Welcome. OK. Um, hold on. I missed like a bunch of comments. Uh, Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Oh my God. I love that you guys are chatting to each other. That's my favorite. That's funny because so far I have the opposite experience. I always have peeps around and being alone is rare. Um, are we talking about the same thing? Are we talking about actually like being alone in your consciousness or just like being physically alone? Like, what are we, do you know what I mean? Are we talking about like not having anyone around? Are we talking about, you know what I mean? I'm not sure I understand. You said, that's funny because I, so far I have the opposite experience. I always have peeps around and being alone is rare. Yeah. So, oh, you're saying, what, how is that the opposite? I don't get it. I don't get it. Um, it's crazy that you learn to get through that, Brittany. It gives me hope though. Good. Good. And don't get me wrong, like I love peeps and I love being around people, but it's not the same as like what I was going through in my 20s, right? Um, yeah, let's go back to. Now this, what came before, um, I think you do a, a good job in the book as well to explain 
uh, that this what came before is not just a simple, let's say, chain of causes, uh, but you use the, the notion of emergent complexity uh, to um, describe like in a more, um, how to say, um, complex way, uh, how uh, behavior is determined, not just by a simple kind of linear line of causes, one cause causing the next. Yeah, and you know, for the last 500 years or so, if you wanted to understand how something complicated worked, the strategy was obvious, break it down into its component right. parts and understand how those parts work and add them back together. And there you go. And you have reductive knowledge. And that was a fantastic thing because it got rid of belief that things like disease were caused by demons. You know, it's what our modern worldview is built on. Um, but it turns out, very, very frequently, the most interesting stuff out there is not best understood at that reductive level of component mm. parts, right. because you put enough of those component parts together, and chaoticism means that you're going to get big, complex outcomes that are intrinsically, provably unpredictable. Right. Or you put enough of these elements together, and even though each one is totally simple and, and straightforward, you put enough of them together, and out emerges things like a cell, or a person, mm. or a right. society, with all sorts of properties that you can't describe on the level of the component parts. Right. And this is amazing. This is like a fantastic revolution, because it shows you it's a deterministic world, but not in the very straight, constrained version that's centuries old of it's a deterministic world that is entirely understandable at the reductive level. It's a deterministic world with all sorts of non-linear, non-additive emergent stuff coming out. Right. And what all sorts of people do when they look at what chaoticism is about or emergent complexity is it's just an irresistible playground to decide, aha, that's where free will is coming from. Okay, I will say this. So there's this um, conversation in this bubble or like in these spheres about like time, like time is a construct, right? But what does that mean? Some people have like lived experiences of sort of like not experiencing time in a linear way versus some people process time in a linear way. So I, of course, have a theory that because we're all living in bubbles, right, the bubbles are giving us different lived experiences, which is why I say you can't escape a bubble. Even if you're evoking like free will, you're still, and I agree, because of your biology and everything that you are living in a specific bubble of your consciousness and your consciousness is having a very specific relationship with things like time. And since time is a construct created, we this like relationship we're having with it can be uh, different. So I think there are people who are as introspective, who are incredible, who have an amazing mind, who are having like a really profound lived experience in the same way that I feel like I'm having, but we're having different ones in different bubbles, but they're all still the same, but they're different parts of a whole puzzle. So my theory is like, instead of thinking again, black and white, like we've discovered this whole thing doesn't exist here. What if you're having this experience here and I'm having this experience here and they're both happening, but your work can't cover this work because it's in a different bubble. So the reason I bubble hop so much and I think everyone has gives me wisdom to share is because even like the like again, limiting language is not going to be helpful when we're actually trying to learn. But what I'm curious about is like what is the belief we're holding on to and what is just like truth we haven't discovered yet. Because I am convinced we have so much truth we haven't discovered yet. I'm curious if I'm discovering truth in my bubble that is like sort of like literally objective. Maybe not because I think we have a very difficult relationship seeking objective truth. Like what does that mean? But like whatever this journey I'm on, I'm having a real experience. But then this person is and then I'm willing to dismantle mine. I'm willing to say, oh, nope, that wasn't right. Scratch that. Next one. Like I am really interested because I've already radically accepted that I'm a ball of energy floating through the universe. I don't have attachment, which is what Dr. K is trying to explain to people. I don't have because I've meditated I and I believe in meditation. I don't have the attachment to me being right. Believe it or not. I literally do not have the attachment to the levels or anything that I'm saying. I'm using it as a tool to actually find 
the thing I can know, which is really rare. We believe so much, we know very little. And what we do know is going to be sub, like, it's going to be predicated on the tools we have present to us. So if people are telling me, oh, I'm having a relationship with time in which I'm not experiencing it in a linear way, okay, let's figure out if that's psychosis. Let's figure out if that's true. Let's figure out if there's a way to figure that out. Let's figure out if we even have the tools to figure that out. And then I say, well, I seem to experience time like in a linear way. So hold on, let's see. Okay, so I'm experiencing this, but if you have people who are having a conversation with you and they're like, no, I don't think that's it. And I'm like, okay, like already. Like, yes, it could not be it, but we have to rule it out because we've ruled it out. And so we're all having different experiences. And I do think people who are all having profound experiences could actually do a detriment to each other when interacting because we're looking for different answers. And so when we come together, we can even create conflict because once again, you can't escape the bubble of being floating energy in a universe. We are all just energy clashing together. No matter how introspective you are, your free will is limited. Because, and this is why you can say you don't have free will, because I, in that moment, can't get somebody who also understands a concept of free will, whatever that means, to engage with me without conflict. We can't all be curious the same way. So you have to engage in some sort of introspection that says, where do I belong to learn things? Where do I go to learn the things that I'm actually trying to learn? So many people will come to me and be like, oh, Brittany, is this what you're talking about? I'm like, no, that's not what I'm talking about. And some people will come to me and be like, Brittany, is this what you're talking about? No, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. I'm looking, I'm talking about something that's very specific. I'm looking, I'm doing something very specific over here. And if you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't, that's okay. But I'm doing this thing. What are you doing? Oh, you're doing that thing? That's so cool. And everyone's like, well, don't you want to do this thing with me over here? No. It's not a group activity. I am a solo student. Have fun, girl. Will I talk to other students doing the same thing I'm doing? Yes. But I don't want to do this thing over here. Okay? Like, I love that you're doing that thing over there. But that's what I mean. I think there's such an infinite amount of information in the world that we could all be doing different things and not even hit it. We're not even going to find it. We're not going to find it. I love the idea that people are still arguing over free will or not free will or determinism. I still think I have... Uh, in the work that I'm doing, I give people a different option to engage with it more. I, I really think what I'm doing is like personal philosophy. I'm talking about the consciousness. My work is definitely focused more on, I think more in relation to actually what like Verveke maybe does, like the meaning crisis, but less like Verveke because he has to adhere to certain bubbles and definitely not like Jordan Peterson who only adheres to his bubble. The idea that Jordan Peterson would ever engage in this conversation is like, that's why they kind of made fun of him a little bit in the beginning. You know what I mean? But then the problem is, are they running into the trap of not being able to transform this language in a way that, it, you know, makes sense on the micro. Because that's what I'm hearing so far is I'm hearing that they're actually having a problem talking about this on the micro, but that doesn't say that their work isn't valid, right? You're talking about the micro? Exactly. My work is, I am interested in people and interpersonal relationships, which are all micro, right? It's all micro. They are talking about complete macro stuff, which I love. But I think that that's what's so difficult, right? Is that their work is going to be very specific, but it informs my work, which informs, you know what I mean? And it's not. Right. Um, I think that's very crucial and very important uh, to point out that your notion of uh, determinacy or being determined specifically is not one um, that um, um, operates with predictability. To the contrary, on the one hand, you think that uh, we are determined, but on the other hand, uh, there is also uh, unpredictability. Could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, the the everyday version of that is like someone sits there and says, okay, here's these three students, which one of them is going to have a spectacular intellectual career, which is going to squander all their gifts, which is going to wind up somewhere in between. And like, you really can't predict that unless you're starting with very extreme cases. You can't predict stuff like that. You can't mm. predict behavior on that level. You can certainly predict it on statistical levels if a society has a steep economic downturn and right. loss of a lot of jobs, more- Ooh, this is what people don't like about my work is that I will make those predictions for individuals because I believe to some extent you can predict it. 
I actually do believe you can predict it only because people are rarely going to engage with free will. So what you're actually predicting is their ability to engage with free will as they age and introspection. The reason people get so mad at me, and I understand why you're mad at me, is they go, you can't predict what I'm going to do. You can't predict that. Yes, I use statistics plus probability of you engaging in free will. And because I can see free will as a spectrum, I can say, "Uh, what are the chances this person actually engages with it? Well, pretty low, bro. So I think statistically you're probably going to do this. And then when people years later come back to me, they're like, holy shit, you were right. They're like, how do you know that? They think I knew something like so profound about their consciousness. And I knew something that like all I did was like I also did statistics. I just did the probability of you engaging in free will and introspection. So it is a statistic. It's just the statistic only known to people like in the philosophy introspection bubble who actually like don't think introspection or philosophy is just ranting about who was right rant or plato <sighs> you know what i mean so again i think i do do this it's interesting that he's saying this but i would argue that maybe i am more deterministic even on the micro because i'm like ah you are going to do this because of this reason but i'm not i'm i'm he's making my he, i'm agreeing with his argument I'm only making it on the statistical probability and the statistical probability is just using a tool that most people don't use in their in their data. Men are going to be physically abusing their wives. That's like a universal of criminology kind of thing, but you can't predict very well individually, at which point people say, aha, the unpredictability is the evidence of free will. Right. The much more- Oh, that's so funny. That's such a funny argument to me. A way of getting at that is what chaotic systems are about are ones that start off very simply and there is absolutely no way, and it could be mathematically proven, there is no way that you could predict what the outcome of the system is going to be once it begins to get sufficiently complex. Right. There's no way to tell if you start at A, what X is going to look like Right. Unless you first see how A causes B right. and B causes C and so on. You have to do every intermediate step. And chaotic systems, that's what they're like. And right. thus, there's then this, this so seductive pull at that point. These are systems that are intrinsically unpredictable. Right. But that but that doesn't mean they're undetermined. And exactly. that's where yes. people I'm make that mistake. Yes, I, and I think that's a, a key uh, conceptual idea that runs through the whole book. And I want to go back to that in the second half of the conversation. Uh, just to do the main song and dance again, I want to talk a little bit more about... Ah, K, yes, K. Unpredictability um, is just self-reporting that we haven't examined enough to see the patterns. I agree. I think like humans are so unique as a consciousness and also so much of a categoried pattern. That's why when people get upset, like Brittany's putting us in categories. I'm also in the category numbnuts. But that's the problem is they're like, oh, Brittany's making a judgment of us. I'm judging myself. This is to figure me out. I made the levels to figure myself out. And then I went on a journey where I challenged myself and I'm literally saying I'm still a student, right? But people don't want to hear that because people are so predictable when they lack introspection or an engagement with free will. It's very predictable. Look at this text message I got from my lovely, lovely mother. Look at the situation that happened at TwitchCon and people were sending me it going, Brittany predicted it, Brittany predicted this. I, it didn't take a rocket scientist, but also they won't see it with their own favorites. And even if they see it with their own favorites, they'll still bully and pile on people. No one is as introspective or engaging with free will as they want to. When people hate tweet me, they're like the lowest denominator of engaging with their free will. They can't help it. Could you imagine having all of the knowledge of free will and living in the present and then choosing to like hate tweet people? Like in a very specific way, like, oh my God, amazing. So here they are engaging in some of the most like, it's like basic monkey behavior. And I'm like, okay, how do I do that? How do I not do that? But the thing is, even I do that. When I tweet certain things that I'm like engaging with those people, that is me engaging in monkey behavior. I'm like, oh shoot, look at me doing it. I'm not engaging in my free will. Okay, why am I getting upset at this? Like, do I have the right to be upset at this? And oh, like, oh, look at the way that this like tweet is making me feel. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, okay, let me like navigate this. It's so interesting because like even I fall into it, which is why I'm saying that my work 
is trying to cover the reality of, again, on the macro, it's all determined. We don't have free will because we're all like little floating balls of energy clashing into one another. But then we get into society and society expects the individual to act a certain way and the individual can pull off or not. But then the individual can go deeper than that and have a relationship with their individual consciousness, right? Their specific consciousness. But then again, when I see things happen on Twitter and I get upset, I'm engaging now in the bubble and then I'm hopping into society and I'm saying, hey, this individual is acting so weird according to the construct that I've created and expected them to perform to. But the, you know what I'm saying? What level can I engage with this person, right? And all of it is fascinating and wonderful. And I'm like, oh, look at that. Why am I upset at this? Or people will say like, oh, why are you worried about what this person thinks? No, I'm worried about how I am thinking about this person. Remember, I'm never worried about why people think the way they think. I'm worried about how I'm processing the way other people think. So when I say like, I don't really get it. Like I, I'm, I'm, when I say like, um, that person is lying. What I'm saying is like, there is something here I don't understand, but I know it's wrong and I'm trying to solve it in my own brain to be correct and to get the right information, not to like, paint someone badly, not to like deceive people, but I'm like, oh, I'm saying there's a problem and I'm like trying to solve it in my own brain. Like, hmm, that doesn't seem right. Because it's always, if you go down to the very nitty gritty of whoever you're examining, there is like a nuance. There is a nitty gritty. I keep getting these messages where people are like, oh, see, Mr. Girl warned us about destiny. Mr. Girl warned us. But Mr. Girl was very incorrect with his assessment. His his thesis was incorrect about Stephen, which is why he must be dismissed because he utilized false accusations and false information to come to his consensus. You wouldn't trust a math, like a, someone who did a math equation, which was like, Mr. Girl went two plus three equals six. And I went, what? That's bad math. And everyone's like, yeah, but look, it's still six. But six, six is the answer. But six is not the answer. It's actually six and a half. And he's missing the half. And also his math was wrong. And so that's why he can't be, he's not allowed to be trusted. His math is wrong. It doesn't work. Mr. Girl is the individual who can't make it in society. And he miscalculated performance. Mr. Girl should not have had his life ruined over destiny. And he didn't. He had his life ruined over his own desire to post content. He should have been smart enough not to post. And on top of that, his life sort of went downhill and he lost his Patreon and everything because he was dumb enough to write a song about being a PDF file and challenging society in a way that isn't real. He's not authentic. He's not an authentic artist in that way. I'm calling him out right now. I'm telling you, it's stupid. He's the guy who literally like said, oh, I understand what the Columbine shooters did what they did or whatever he said in college that got him almost expelled, right? He's he's misfunctioning. He's not function. He's dysfunctional in a way that's too like, it, you can't engage with it, right? Like it's not he's not engaging properly with any part of society. Like he's not even understanding that his art, though talented and like good in some way, isn't good enough to actually be worth defending, right? Because it's not that good. What is he trying to say? What is this profound message that he's sending us? What is it? Because I don't think he knows. I think he's disguising it and making it look or seem profound to certain people because he's got good production and he he's like good at making videos but I don't think there's a message behind the video, right? So again, like when we're making an assessment of somebody, I'm only interested in what's correct. I'm not interested in what makes you look like you're winning. About the second half of the book. And I think that's obviously di directly connected with uh, the idea of indeterminacy, uh, where you very strongly emphasize uh, the notion of change. Mm. Uh, that is to say um, that again, being determined uh, shouldn't be confused with uh, that there is no possibility to change, but rather the contrary. So maybe you can say a little bit about this part as well. Exactly. I would say like the three building blocks of people freaking out at the notion that there's no free will, the three sort of approachable building blocks, and then the one that's like deep. Yet. You know what's so funny though? If you asked a person, do you believe in free will? They're like, yeah, I think I'm smart and amazing and I know what I'm doing. And then you'll say, then why are you hitting your wife? Why are you cheating on your husband? Why are you having 10 baby mamas? Why are you in debt? Why are you making bad decisions? And then they'll say, oh, well, um, you know, it's my trauma. Ah, so you don't have free will because your trauma is leading your story. 
oh, well, um, it's my biology, actually. I'm, uh, I have a predisposition for X, Y, Z. I have ADHD. I have autism. Oh, so actually you're saying you don't have free will and you, you're saying this, but then you can, again, when you're having a relationship with free will on a spectrum, can we call this overcoming? But I think that's the wrong word. I think you have a symbiotic relationship with those things. And you're actually, regardless of the hurdles, getting through because you're having a better relationship with it. So people will say like, oh, if only I could cure this thing, but that's not how life works because you're a biological creature. So you are forced to engage with the limits of your biology. Like if you're disabled, you're disabled. Like what are we going to do, you know? But like at the same time, we can overcome and have a different relationship, right? With our free will, which engages our introspection, which engages everything else, which leads us to having a specific relationship with our consciousness, right? So we can kind of play our own game within the world of games. Because remember, on the macro, we're floating energy in the universe, clashing together, creating conflict. And then when we come down, society level, like society labels us and ostracizes us. And then we can do that ourselves or we can come back and be like, okay, how do I find a society that is less likely to harm me? And then how do I, within that society, create a bubble in which my individual consciousness can live in? deeply existential the first one is this myth that if the world is deterministic nothing can change this is gibberish and when you actually Mm -hmm. look at the biology of how change occurs not only does it prove that change occurs but it shows even more mechanistically how the world works the second one that immediately comes up is oh my god you're just gonna have like people running amok because everyone is going to decide they can't be held responsible for anything at all. And you'll have no way of controlling dangerous. Mm. Actually, let me see if I can find it. There was a comment here that stood out to me. There was a comment that I saw that was really nice and it kind of reminded me of the levels that I was laughing where somebody was like, "Um, I'm really excited that I figured out, you know, everything is kind of determined in a way because all the horrible things that are happening in the world, I know that like it is just what it is, right? And I think what I want to say is humans are going to human and what I would say is you need to radically accept all things are true that some people are nicer than others and some people are evoking more introspection than others and some people are choosing. But when you radically accept that humans are going to human, you're also more compassionate and loving and forgiving, but you're not accepting that they'll never change. Like they're saying, you're accepting that it is what it is and naturally the change won't look the way you want it to. I think what they're really trying to say to us and what I'm hearing at least is that it's not up to you. You are just a part of this. And the only thing that's up to you, in my opinion, is the relationship you're having with your specific consciousness. Not with society, not with like everyone else. That's why when people are like, Brittany, give your opinion about X tragedy. Are you asking Brittany the specific consciousness? No. Because when I start to give that opinion, you go, no, 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 not that one. Give the one that I want you to give because I'm society and I need you to reinforce my belief. Give that one. Oh, you mean the individual, Brittany. The one that says like, I'm a YouTuber and I should give the right comment about the right. How about this? Do no harm. Harm reduct. Harm reduction. That's my message. Harm reduction. Whatever it takes to cause less harm in the long run. Do that. And it's not going to look the way you want it to look. It's not going to look the way you want it to look, right? People and, and yeah, you get rid of the criminal justice system in its entirety, which I think is the only intellectual and moral outcome of viewing us as having no free will. That doesn't mean you let dangerous people run around on the streets. Sure. You have a car whose brakes don't work. And you keep it off the streets, but you don't preach to the car about has a, it has a rotten soul. Right. Right. Doing this. So I think that. Right. I think like in my ideal world, again, 
we'd have like a space in society, like maybe a garden space. And I know what people are thinking. They're like, why should they get a garden space when I don't have one? Girl, in an ideal society, we would all have beautiful like places to live and a great society to live in. If society functioned at its highest as a collective, which it can't do because, you know, but like if it could, we would have a society where all the bad people were put into not prisons the way we have them now, but like we would dignify their humanity because we see them reflected in ourselves. But what we do instead is call them a monster and separate them, which to be fair, is a fair reaction as a biological animal. It is fair to f- f- it is fair to say, oh, this thing scares me so much, kill it. We do that. We have capital punishment in America. People do that now. And sometimes even I have the biological urge to be like, oh my God, what? But then I think to myself, okay, what do I do with this consciousness that is a living creature? Do I give them a way out? Do I give them dignity and death? Or do I give them a place to live where they're not, you know, beaten up or ostracized or like, well, they're ostracized, of course, but they're not, um, I don't want to become an ugly thing because an ugly thing happened to me. I work very hard not to become ugly, like the ugly things that have happened to me. And so much of society justifies becoming ugly because ugly things have happened to them. And I'm trying really hard not to do that and it's very difficult because again, when you're not evoking free will, you're going to go for the biology and the biology is going to tell you to become ugly like nature needs to become ugly sometimes to defend itself or to like, you know, attack. And I'm saying, what if I didn't become ugly? What would life be like if I didn't become ugly? It's sort of the second area that has to be unpacked. What are the approaches we could take to subtracting out a sense of responsibility for some of the worst things that people can do Mm. and make the world not only a safer place, but a more humane one? And we've been doing that time and time again over centuries. Just keep doing it. I would say the third one where people get caught up with stuff in this determined second sense of the worst definition is most people who say yeah 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 the world is made of atoms but there's free will draw this completely false dichotomy we have our attributes our eye color how tall we are whether we're going to have a good memory span for numbers whether we're going to have an artistic sense whether we're going to have a strong propensity towards empathy whether any of that stuff is biological that's the stuff we're born with Mm -hmm. those are our basic attributes and here winds up being this disastrous leap into this belief that what isn't biological is aha what do you do with those traits do Mm -hmm. you work hard to overcome your lack of natural gifts do you squander your talents do you show self-discipline are you self-indulgent that's the real stuff that measures who we are as people and it is this completely irrational belief that like being able to have perfect pitch as a musician that's made of biology but practicing a lot to get really good on your instrument that's made a different stuff right, right. that's made of fairy dust mm. right. so those are the three and when you look at where does self control come from and why are some of us better at it than others and where do all that it's made of the same biology stuff often right. of a very different quality as all the other features contributing Love to it. making us who we are mm. Is this not a great fucking video, bros? I know some of you already watched it. We're only 20 minutes in. It's so good. It's not very long, actually. It's about 15 minutes total. In my head, in real life while I'm dead, my belly's being fed and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine, not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, 